and senior consultant columbia asia referral hospital she is the past president of aspa iapa iacta and rs acp she is the chair of the pediatric committee of uh, the wfs madam we are really fortunate you have with us uh, for this academic program and i am really honored to welcome you to this meeting on behalf of isa kerala state chapter and on my own personal behalf to join with us uh, for this topic discussion we have a team of panelists dr shamesh who is the consultant pediatric anesthesiologist kanji kamakodi child trust hospital chennai sir i am really happy to welcome you to this meeting Dr. Ekta Rai, who is the Professor, Head of Pediatric and OBG Anesthesia Unit, CMC Vellore, is with us as the panelist for today's discussion. Madam, welcome to this meeting. Dr. Elsa Vargas, who is the President of Indian Association of Pediatric Anesthesiologists, also is uh, in the panelist to discuss and to share her experience. Uh, Madam is one of the senior boss persons in this field. and uh, on behalf of isa kerala state chapter i extend a warm welcome madam dr lakshmi kumar who is the professor of anesthesia and hod amrutha institute of medical sciences kochi is a, is a one of our active member and uh, an academician from our state madam i welcome you to this meeting the second part of today's discussion is a new topic which we are all uh, enthusiastic to hear that is the anesthesia for fetal surgery we have dr eka vargis who is the professor department of anesthesiology from amrutha institute of medical sciences kochi madam on behalf of isa kerala state chapter i welcome you to this meeting i also take this opportunity to welcome our uh, isa national president elect dr venkatagiri kayam and uh, today's webinar coordinator dr vijesh panugobal who is the governing council member and professor of kem city medical college kolikot and uh, our uh, honorable secretary dr ben laisak matthew and the senior teachers like dr meenakshi sundaran and other officials i extend all the delegates all others at a warm welcome and request uh, dr giri for a few opening remarks good evening uh, president uh, dr nazar secretary binil today's faculty is uh, rebecca madam rebecca madam uh ramesh sir ekta madam then uh, we have uh, elsa madam she is to join and uh, uh, lakshmi kumar uh, it is our endeavor that we should give the best possible to the pgs uh, with the webinars weekly when this uh, uh, pandemic started pgs were not getting teaching or uh, or lessing and also we were finding that some there were some uh, pg telling that the dnb not getting the exposure like others so we thought that uh, we should uh, have this uh, webinars weekly and to get the best people from all over india and elsewhere to teach there is an opportunity for them to get exposed to the best faculties all over india so we have the best faculties in bdr kanasisha from all over india who have agreed to uh, deliberate today and it is for the pg to take benefit of this and uh, improve their skills and knowledge and prepare for the exams so with this i thank uh, rebecca madam and the team for uh, agreeing to spare their time today evening and uh, uh, share their experience and take class and i also thank uh, vijish uh, for uh, being coordinating today's uh, program thank you all and uh, thank you all because we have the uh, vips in the audience or this thing including dr meenachi many are to join that thank you all and uh, over to you vijay uh, thank you sir At the outset uh, we'll start the uh, program that is neonatal emergencies this shall be followed by a panel discussion and then we shall take up the questions in the chat box one by one so i request all the post graduates as well as the practice in anesthesiologists to make full use of this opportunity and uh, clear all their doubts you can put your all your questions in the chat box over to rebecca ma'am for her talk on neonatal emergencies
it gives me great pleasure to speak on this topic. Um, basically, neonates are different. They have a different physiology. They deal with drugs differently. Their organ systems are immature. They're vulnerable to stress. And therefore, it's important to do a detailed perinatal as well as a maternal history. Now, we talk about neonatal surgical emergencies, but there are very few that are really emergencies. They're urgencies. Emergencies we would talk of only if we were worried about losing their airway or whether there was any vascular compromise. Therefore, most patients, most babies can wait for 24 to 48 hours for us to stabilize them and then allow for better fetal to neonatal transition. In the first week of life, what we commonly see are congenital diaphragmatic hernia, tracheoesophageal fistula, omphalocele and gastrochysis, intestinal obstruction, and congenital lung cysts or lobi emphysema. Meningomyeloceles have been placed in this group, but we only would cause um, call them an emergency if the meningomyeloceal was leaking or was in danger of rupturing. In the second week and later comes a necrotizing enterocolitis and the hernia only if there's a worry of obstruction. So let's start off with congenital lung cysts or loba emphysema. There are four major congenital cystic lesions of the lung and they share similar embryological and clinical characteristics. That is the congenital loba emphysema, pulmonary sequestration, congenital cystic adenomatoid malformation or CCCAM as it is often called, and bronchogenic pulmonary cysts. Where are they located? Some are central. They may be on the anterior mediastinum, maybe at the carina or at the hilum. Others are paratracheal or they may occur within the lung parenchyma. How do they present? It may be a mass effect pushing the mediastinum to one side or the other, may obstruction to airflow, which may be fixed or ball valve effect with hyperinflation. There may be chronic respiratory infection or abscess formation, and this comes on a little later in life or they may rupture with hemorrhage or bronchopleural fistula formation. Taking for example, a congenital uh, loba emphysema. Now you may think this is a tension pneumothorax, or you may think there's less lung volume here with consolidation, but this is congenital loba emphysema causing a mass effect, pushing the mediastinum to the left. What are the anesthetic challenges? We need to provide sleep, amnesia, and analgesia while minimizing further enlargement of the cyst. We have to ensure adequate ventilation and oxygenation, maintain cardiovascular stability, and of course, your surgeon will want good surgical conditions. Induction. We know that a crying, struggling child can increase the amount of air trapping, and therefore a sedative premedication is very useful in these cases to prevent screaming and crying. Positive pressure ventilation can also increase air trapping. So it's good to have an IV in place and a steel induction would be the way to go. To maintain your induction, do it with sedation if it's awake, an inhalational agent for a steel induction. Keep the child on spontaneous respiration until the thorax is opened. If you have to have assisted ventilation, do keep the peak inspiratory pressure low. Alternatively, you may use sedation and IV ketamine. High frequency oscillatory ventilation with low airway pressures is a good alternative rather than using IPPV. And local infiltration of the surgical incision site or intercostal blocks can be of help to provide analgesia. 
avoid using nitrous oxide because we don't want the um, lung cyst to increase in size. Now, anesthesia per se, we'd like to isolate the lung. We may use selective endobronchial blocker, especially if the cyst is fluid filled, infected, or linked to the bronchial tree in a bronchopleural fistula. Different ways of doing it, you may use an endotracheal tube down one lung, use a Fogarty embolectomy catheter. I don't really like this because they tend to slip, especially in the neonate, or you may use a bronchial blocker. Points to remember when you are on one lung. You need not continue with the same tidal volume. You may decrease the tidal volume and increase the frequency of respiration. Monitor ETCO2 and airway pressures. Monitor pulse oximetry and blood pressure. Increase inspired oxygen to 100% if required. And ensure hemodynamic stability with gentle reminders to the surgeons to ease on the retraction, especially you have to talk to the assistant who wants to see what's happening and then presses on the heart. You always have to have your endotracheal tube or double lumen tube accessible to you so that if there is a blockage or the tube shifts, you can access the tube. Have an extra suction with appropriate size catheters for your exclusive use. Let the surgeons have their own suction. You keep a separate suction for yourself. If the lung cyst expands suddenly and there is cardiovascular compromise, remember to do an emergency needle aspiration of the cyst or ask the surgeon to quickly open the chest and relieve the pressure. Now we go on to a congenital diaphragmatic hernia which is a little more common than the lung cysts. The incidence, as we know it from the Western literature, we don't have any literature of our own. The incidence is one in 4,000 to 5,000 live births and pretty high mortality rate. It occurs due to a failure of closure of the diaphragm permitting the abdominal contents to herniate into the thorax. It occurs early in gestation and interferes with normal lung growth. It usually occurs on the posterolateral foramen of bock leg and respiratory distress is marked because usually a lot of bowel goes into the chest and pushes the lung to the opposite side. Few do occur through the anterolateral foramen of morgagni, which is retrosternal and here, there is tendency to intestinal obstruction rather than respiratory distress. This would be going up the posterolateral um, bogdalek and most of the bowel you find in the thorax. It presents with severe respiratory distress. The baby has a scaphoid abdomen because the abdominal contents are sitting in the chest. The apex beat would be shifted to the opposite side. There's poor air entry and you may hear the bowel sounds in the chest. Very often there's hypoxia and acidosis. Now the clinical presentation and pathology and the outcome depends on the degree of lung hypoplasia, which may range from the lung being very small and immature to a well-developed normal lung. Now, lung hypoplasia is often ipsilateral, but very occasionally it can be bilateral. The degree of hypoplasia depends on the time during gestation when the hernia occurred. If it occurs early in gestation, the lung development is very poor. If it has come on later, there has been time for the lung to develop. Now, lung hypoplasia is associated with pulmonary hypertension, and this is what we dread. It increases right to left shunting, worsens hypoxia and acidosis. The pulmonary hypertension may be treated with vasodilators like tolazolin, prostacycline, and the baby comes to you on these drugs, dipyridamol and nitric oxide. There's a decreased preload and cardiac output could occur due to kinking of the IVC, or there may be associated cardiac anomalies and malrotation. 
Associated anomalies very often are vertebral anomalies, imperforate anus, tracheoesophageal fistula, radial aplasia, and renal anomalies, all making up the word vector. Now, vector, you add the cardiac and limb abnormalities to this. What are the indicators of poor prognosis? If there's severe pulmonary hypertension, if there are associated cardiac abnormalities, major cardiac abnormalities, a high preoperative alveolar to arterial oxygen gradient, severe hypercarbia despite vigorous ventilation, or poor pulmonary compliance, prognosis is very poor. Now, what do you do initially? As soon as you see this baby with a scaphoid abdomen, or you would have done an ultrasound earlier and you know that this baby is coming with a problem, you put in an NG tube and decompress the stomach, Position the neonate semi-recumbent with the hernia side down. That x-ray you saw, the hernia was on the left side. So you put the left side down. Do not mask ventilate because your ventilation may increase the volume of air in the stomach. And if that is so, and the stomach is in the chest, you're going to make matters much worse. You insert an endotracheal tube and ventilate to maintain normal cardia. Occasionally, you may have to use permissive hypercarbia. We'll come across that in a little while. You must maintain the body temperature, monitor and correct ABG and electrolytes. What are your challenges? There could be hypoxia, hypotension. Has the baby come to you on inotropes or on other drugs? Primary pulmonary hypertension, right ventricular failure, and the usual hypocalcemia, worry about analgesia, IV access, and how you're going to ventilate the baby. So you design anesthetic to minimize sympathetic discharge, which will exacerbate pulmonary hypertension. Perhaps you could use an opioid-based anesthetic. Hyperventilate to produce respiratory alkalosis. Ventilate with small tidal volumes and low inflating pressures to avoid contralateral pneumothorax. Don't try to inflate up the lung and make the lung bigger because you would cause pneumothorax on the good side. 100% oxygen to decrease pulmonary vascular resistance and maintain body temperature, intravascular volume and acid base status. So the key points in CDH is to monitor airway pressures. Any sudden increase in pressure, airway pressure could indicate a pneumothorax, you will need to put in a chest strain. Pulmonary hypertension can worsen with hypoxia, hyperthermia, and acidosis. Avoid these. Avoid the acidosis. You can introduce alkalosis, and it helps to improve pulmonary flow. But in some cases, you may not be able to bring down your uh, carbon dioxide to less than 45. You may just have to accept that. Remember, acid and sodium excretion requires mature kidneys. Do not use nitrous oxide, which can worsen hypoxia and produce distension of the intestine. You may use high-frequency os oscillatory ventilation or ECMO may be required in very severe cases. Now let's talk about a case I did a long time ago. This was a term neonate born two days previously. He was intubated and ventilated in the neonatal nursery. On conventional ventilation, his preductal saturation was only 83% and postductal was only 76% and he was severely acidotic. So he was put on high frequency oscillatory ventilation and his saturation came up to 100% with an FiO2 of one. Umbilical artery and vein were cannulated, a peripheral IV was on the leg, and he was on dopamine and dobutamine. He was stabilized being, before being taken up for surgery. This is the high-frequency oscillatory ventilator. We had a transabdominal subcostal in, uh, incision. This was the bowel, which was in the chest, and all of it was removed to be placed in the abdomen. And this is what we found. This little nubbin is all there was of the lung. The lung was very immature and poorly developed. So you can imagine how much his pulmonary hypertension was. 
The defect was closed with a mesh, but sad to say, we couldn't save that child because we could never take him off the high frequency oscillatory ventilator. The next uh, I think I would like to discuss is tracheoesophageal fistula. There are, there are many different varieties. The most common variety is C, where the upper part of the esophagus forms a pouch and the lower part of the esophagus opens out into the trachea. Now in these diagrams, it looks like it's coming out of the side of the trachea, but actually it occurs in the posterior muscular part of the trachea. It occurs in one in 3000 live births and 50% of them have con other congenital abnormalities. How do you diagnose it? The mother may have polyhydramnios. The baby may be mucousy after birth, maybe cyanosis and choking after feeds and a passage of NG tube is not possible. So you'll see an NG tube, which is curled up in the upper pouch. Complications are usually due to aspiration of saliva, aspiration of feeds, and in some cases, the gastric juice comes up and goes into the lungs. All lead to pulmonary soiling and infection. So what do we do? We keep the upper pouch, the esophageal pouch, free of secretions with suction frequently, chest physiotherapy, and antibiotics. Now, we may do pre-surgical bronchoscopy, and we will be talking about it during the panel discussion. Surgical management may be primary closure. That is, when this pouch is close to the lower uh, end of the esophagus, you may be able to bring the two ends together. But if these, the space is very uh, wide and you cannot bring down this uh, upper pouch to the lower pouch and anastomose it without tension. If there is this wide space and there's too much tension, the surgeon may opt for an esophagostomy to be able to keep the upper pouch clean and a gastrostomy for feeding so that a second stage is done and the surgery may be uh, done and a second stage when the anastomosis may be done when the child is bigger. Now, what about intubation? The big worry is that if we ventilate the child, whatever we ventilate the child will, will go down up the tracheoesophageal fistula, go off into the stomach and you may not be able to ventilate the lungs. So that is the big worry that we will not be able to provide adequate ventilation. So we intubate under deep anesthesia and keep the baby on spontaneous respiration. So he is ventilating his lungs by himself. The endotracheal tube is passed so that the tip of it goes beyond the origin of the tracheoesophageal fistula, but is placed above the carina. Don't continue with ventilation because you may have uh, gastric distension. The fistula may also be occluded by using a Fogarty pass through a rigid scope if you have a gastrostomy or from above. This is in surgery, you'll see the head end is to your left, foot end is to the right, the right side of the baby is up, left side is down. So surgery is done in the left lateral position through a right thoracotomy by an extra pleural approach but it may also be done endoscopically at which time you will find that there's less uh, pain or analgesia required. Now points to think about. During surgery, beware of loss of lower good lung ventilation because the endotracheal tube can slip into the fistula. How do you diagnose this? There may be a sudden increase in airway pressure and you should have a stethoscope on the left side of the chest that is, when the child has the left side down, fix a stethoscope there before you start the surgery. You will listen to the air entry and it will be good. If you suddenly lose that air entry, it means that your endotracheal tube has slipped. Watch out for over-enthusiastic retraction of the mediastinum by the assistant, leading to cardiac compression and hypotension. Now, if the baby is small, if he has aspirated preoperatively or if the anastomosis is under tension, 
consider post operative ventilation we go on to another problem anterior abdominal wall uh, defects which could be omphalocele or gastroschisis first let's look at the omphalocele oh boy i'm going uh, too fast the omphalocele occurs early in the pregnancy it's in the 10th week of life there's non return of extra embryonic of the bowel from the extra embryonic coelom and therefore it is covered with the membrane called the amnion you'll see the umbilical cord is at the apex of the sac it's classified into a minor defect which is 5 cm or a major defect which may even contain the liver because it occurs in early pregnancy it is associated with other congenital anomalies gastroschisis occurs later in life and so not usually associated with other anomalies but it occurs due to occlusion of the omphalo mesenteric artery there's ischemia and atrophy of the abdominal wall and the bowel is left exposed here there's massive fluid loss and electrolyte loss there's no covering there's a tendency to infection as well now your perioperative concerns are massive fluid loss be pr uh, prepared to replace plenty of fluid especially in gastroschisis infection you prevent it and you treat it you prevent hypothermia because when the bowel is exposed it's exposed to the um, atmospheric pressure temperature and the child can get hypothermic now the closure of the abdomen you must use plenty of muscle relaxant do not use nitrous oxide the if you're going to put all this bowel into the abdomen and close the abdomen tight there may be impaired venous return and edema of the lower body so do put the iv access in the arms rather than in the legs respiratory compromise may occur post op and the baby may need ventilation there may be concomitant congenital abnormalities especially in omphalocele now the surgery it would be better if the surgeon does not pull all the bowel out better to limit evisceration when he puts it back into the abdomen he should avoid accidental volvulus the defect is reduced and closed immediately only if there's no significant viscero abdominal disproportion what do i mean by this if there's a lot of bowel outside and the abdomen is small and scaphoid all of this bowel is not going to go in without a tight primary closure so if there is too much bowel outside you may cover the bowel with a plastic wrap or bowel bag like this the bowel is kept outside uh, in a plastic cover which is then closed the child is ventilated post op and slowly over time this um, bowel is put back into the abdomen the criteria to assess abdominal pressure for safe closure is important very very important the intragastric pressure which you would measure with an ng tube should be less than 20 cm of water intravesical pressure which is the bladder pressure which you'd measure with a foley catheter should be less than 20 cm of water ETCO2 should be less than 50 mm of mercury and the maximum ventilatory pressure should be less than or equal to 35 cm of water so if you these criteria are met then you may close the abdomen if not you'll have the abdominal compartment syndrome better to close with a um, plastic silo now for the gastrointestinal emergencies there's obstruction compromised intestinal blood supply or a combination of both now intestinal obstruction can be due to a number of causes it could be atresia could be malrotation peritoneal bands intra abdominal hernia meconiomyelitis intersusception many things but i am not going to be talking about them individually i would like to classify them as 
upper intestinal obstruction and lower intestinal obstruction. The upper GI or duodenum presents early in the first 24 hours. Usually the mother has polyhydramnios. The baby tends to vomit. He has dehydration, sodium loss, hypochloremia, metabolic alkalosis and aspiration. If he has duodenal atresia, you may see a double bubble in the x-ray that is a gastric air and duodenal air and that is what is called a double bubble or duodenal atresia. Anesthesia, you correct the above and you must protect the airway because this tends to have regurgitation. So now we go on to the lower GI. Lower GI doesn't present early, it presents late except in imperforate anus. The baby has abdominal distension and failure to pass feces or meconium. And the sequestration of fluid and electrolytes in the bowel, it's within the baby, it's not outside. Like in upper GI, the baby is vomiting. You can see the loss. Here, the loss is within the abdomen. So he's dehydrated, he has acidosis, and vomiting could be late. Now, your anesthesia and lower GI, you delay surgery, except if there's intersusception where vascularity is compromised. We did say that if there was a compromise of um, vascularity, we should operate early. Other cases, you correct dehydration, check acidosis. You may require up to 30 to 40 ml per kilogram of colloid. That's quite a bit. You must protect the airway, give plenty of muscle relaxants, but do not use nitrous oxide. These are examples of uh, intestinal obstruction is meconium ileus, intersusception where you see um, the appendix has gone into the intersusception. Lastly, we come to necrotizing enterocolitis. Uh, this is what is, uh, was first described by Koslowski and it's called the Koslowski's triad. That is intestinal ischemia, colonization of pathogenic bacteria, an excess protein substrate in intestinal lumen, all of which causes necrosis of the bowel with perforation and sepsis. Etiology may be prenatal asphyxia, umbilical artery catheterization, hyperosmolar feeds, exchange transfusion, or a PDA where there's decreased blood supply to the bowel. The children present with abdominal distension, Ileus, bloody stools, peritonitis, septicemia, acidosis, and shock, coagulopathy, and pneumatosis intestinalis. What do I mean by pneumatosis intestinalis? There is air within the wall of the intestines. So air tends to get into the wall of the intestines, then the intestines tend to perforate. And this is an X-ray of the baby where there's a lot of air free air in the baby's abdomen. So this really has a very poor prognosis. What you have to do is to give gut rest, stop feeds, do a gastric decompression, treat the infection with appropriate antibiotics. Nutrition, you have to give, um, maybe given intravenously, metabolic acidosis to be corrected, hypovolemia to be corrected, correct the coagulopathy. And remember, every time you take blood for a sample, you're going to make the child more anemic. So watch out for uh, iatrogenic anemia. And respiratory distress needs preoperative ventilation. Uh, you may need to exteriorize the bowel and bring the baby for a, uh, another surgery later when he's better to anastomose the bowel. Thank you. These are my references and my references for the respiratory thoracic. I think I would recommend this article, the review article by Gregory Hammer, which is in pediatric thoracic anesthesia, um, which is very good. Um, may we go on to the panel discussion? We have uh, panelists who have been introduced already. Um, can we now 
have the first question to Dr. Ramesh. Ramesh, are you there? Are you able to see, ma'am? Yeah. I'm there, ma'am. Doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah. Okay. What are the minimum blood tests required before taking up a neonate for anesthesia, Ramesh? Uh, Can you see the screen? I'm able to see the screen, yeah. Yeah. And what serum potassium would you accept as normal? Actually, I, I, I'm just thinking that uh, neonates can come for a, a usual, maybe a normal surgery, the normal good neonates coming for hernias. And uh, I, I think I'll classify into probably into a non-sick child, normal neonate, and another is a sick child coming for uh, emergency, like what you have spoken to me before with uh, diaphragmatic hernia, tracheal fistula. But basically for hernia, neonatal hernia, now it's becoming common. I think we, must, uh, we do is uh, complete blood count. And complete blood count will tell you about the hemoglobin, which will know that's the level of the hemoglobin, because you know it's anemia will in a premature will cause apnea of prematurity, so you have to correct. And uh, second is that the blood count, which is high, you know there may be an infection which we have to treat. Third is important thing is the platelet count. I think that's a very important because platelet count is the only count which is going to share with the coagulation problems, especially the neonate. I do PT and PTT also, but because I'm doing for the last about 30 years, I'm still doing PT, PTT, but I think it's not very, very significant as far as the neonate is concerned because the coagulation in a neonate depends more on the platelet aggregation and fibrin, but still on PT may be normal and APTT is always prolonged. So it is, uh, and whether even if it is prolonged, it's not very clinically correlate with the bleeding or not bleeding in a neonate. I, but I do PT and PTT, but even in the references, everybody says prolonged, not useful, but still some people do. But we don't have a real protocol and it should be followed by the protocol of the institution. I think that's what we are doing. But in a sick child, like a diaphragmatic hernia, CLE, and non-ventilator or omphalocele, uh, intestinal obstruction, I, we add uh, blood urea nitrogen and serum electrolytes. I think that's very important. And in case your in child is on a ventilator with the TEF or with a severe infection, I think we can do an arterial blood gas as well. What about serum uh, potassium? What would you accept as normal? You see, this is a very uh, small. I have seen some adult anesthesiologists who have been doing it, and the potassium is 5.8 in unit. They said it's hyperkalemia, they postponed. I think it's very important to find uh, to know that potassium varies in uh, preterm and the neonate, older child, and up to one year. As far as uh, the normal potassium, the adult comes after one year. So up to one year, we can. there are some uh, neonatology books uh, says that premature is 4 to 6.5, a neonate is 3.7 to 5.9. As an anesthesiologist, we can't remember everything, but what I feel is 4 to 6.5, we can take it as a normal. So I think it's 4 to 6.5, we can uh, taste a normal for serum potassium. If you get a 6.5, because one thing is we sometimes we skews and uh, take the blood, then the potassium may be a little high. So I don't think about the lie, a little high potassium, we should not be bothered. Uh, do any of the other panelists have anything else to say about the blood test? Lakshmi, Ekta, Elsa? No, I, I don't think I have anything else to add. Okay, Ramesh has said it all. I just, I just want to comment about this. Actually, I, Dr. Rebecca, I am going back to my postgraduate days. The way in which you are teaching, I think we don't have a teachers like this too. So like a postgraduate, we have become a practitioner. So I may not know whatever is say may be useful for the postgraduates because I don't know they have to write, exactly say what is the references and the books. But I think this because of this, I feel this is what it is. Four to 6.5 is, uh, uh, I think it is acceptable even in the books to say it's uh, normal in a, a neonate. Okay, Elsa, when is a chest X-ray indicated in neonates before anesthesia? Well, I certainly would not ask. Can you hear me, Rebecca? Yes, you hear me? Yes. Okay. 
No, that's a good question because, um, you know, we seem to be ro doing routine chest x-rays for adults, but for a neonate, there really is no uh, role for it. For one, if you ask, ask for a chest x-ray, you need to know how to interpret it. And it's a little difficult to interpret chest x-rays in neonates. Uh, for instance, if they have a lot of thymus, it might appear as a, uh, as a, like a, like a patch on, on the right side or the left side. And so it can be confusing if you don't know. So the actual indications for a surgical uh, neonate would be only, for instance, in the cases that you mentioned, a congenital diaphragmatic hernia where you might diagnose it if you have a, a um, air-filled uh, bowel in, in the chest or a, a shift of the mediastinum, et cetera. Or, uh, uh, so those are the things you'd be looking for. Or for instance, a tracheoesophageal fistula where you might want to pass a small rubber catheter and see whether it coils up. But those would be the very clear indications, surgical indications. Otherwise, most of the time, one would do ask for a chest X-ray if there is basically a cardiac or a pulmonary pathology in the in the baby, either bronchopulmonary dysplasia or, um, for instance, if the child has aspirated uh, meconium, meconium aspiration, or for instance, if the child baby has been hyperventilated and there is a pneumothorax. Otherwise, routinely, you wouldn't want to uh, say, check whether if you've intubated where the tube is or whether it's come out or when you've reintubated. But if you have any doubt about the position of a tube, for instance, in the ventilated baby before taking up for surgery, that might be another indication uh, I would think of. Um, I would suggest that we would uh, base our uh, investigations on clinical. Yes, exactly. So if you find a child is tachypneic, or if you're suspecting, if you're in a center which does not have, say, echo, and you're not sure whether the child has a congenital heart disease, uh, then you might want to have a chest X-ray. So I, in my mind, those are the main indications for... The other thing for postgraduates is... Uh, yes, under the diaphragm. Get familiar, get familiar with uh, neonatal X-rays because yes. a thymus is a very large part of the chest in a baby. Yes. So don't think that a thymus is pathological. In a neonate, a thymus is something you may see. The other thing is when you're requesting an X-ray, if the postgraduate is going with the baby, please see that they put a little bit of lead on the baby's genitals. Yeah. Protect that baby's genitals if you're sending for a chest X-ray because it's something that we tend to forget because we are more worried about what the chest is showing. Uh, Maybe one more, if I can one more, put one more point in, Rebecca, is that sometimes if the child has got other lines, for instance, an umbilical arterial cath line or, or a venous, uh, venous line or a pick line if uh, required, then sometimes you might want to know the position of the tip and if in case you want it readjusted before taking the child up. So I don't know if anyone else has anything else to add. Um, Lakshmi, do you have... Lakshmi or Ekta? Yeah, if I may, ma'am, uh, uh, it's in a neonate, you, you really don't have to ask for a chest X-ray. Yeah. The surgeon wants something in the abdomen. And yes. And when they put the baby, the baby probably fits into the entire... Uh, exactly. Uh, you know, the end. So it's like pick and choose whichever area you want. So... We probably don't ask, but it comes. And uh, ma'am very rightly said you should know how to interpret the chest X-ray. You know, is the heart globular or is there an effusion and other things like the thymus. So perhaps we don't ask, but many of the conditions in which the surgeon may want an X-ray by default includes uh, thorax as well. So probably then we should know how to interpret it to meaningfully for us. Exactly. Thank you. The next question is for Dr. Lakshmi. Most neonates have raised bilirubin levels. Um, when will the high level be considered significant? So, um, if I'm, um, uh, yeah, when you're talking about a child coming for surgery with raised bilirubin levels, um, most of the neonatal Agencies which ma'am has made the atresias, the ileal, jejunal, uh, or rectorias actually come with being in time for the to rise. 
So you don't deal with race bilirubin in that group. So there is a somewhat select group, perhaps for say posterior urethral valve surgery or urethric surgery, or sometimes a thoracic surgery like an emphysema that may present to you with bilirubin levels. Now the next thing is what kind of bilirubin levels would you see? Day five to day fifteen, perhaps you. would see only a physiologist the causes of it most often are abo or rh incompatibility rarely g6pd deficiencies and then some other congenital abnormality when would i be worried well um, actually by the time the surgeon and the neonatologist confer on taking the child for surgery you will have an idea basically you need to know if the child is preterm or full term now when i spoke to the neonatologist they said there is a nomogram which is by dr butani and they have nomograms as when you should alert your reflexes or think of phototherapy on bilirubin levels and these are largely based upon the maturity of the child and the level of bilirubin so a full uh, child beyond 35 weeks only needs phototherapy if the bilirubin levels are about 20 whereas a preterm or small for gestational age you may want to have phototherapy that is given at lower levels of bilirubin so so the level that i consider significant will be subjective based upon the child's maturity thank you next actor what are the common antibiotics that you use in a neonate and their dose which is used for prophylaxis before surgery or if there's a pathology like say necrotizing enterocolitis or if he's got a lung abscess or whatever uh what are the antibiotics you like to use so um uh, first of all uh, by default giving antibiotics may not be very good idea so judicious judicious use of antibiotics based on what kind of patients we are dealing with what kind of environment we are in and also on the as ma'am said based on pathology which decides what surgery is going to happen so based on these three factors we decide and most of our patients do get uh, prophylactic antibiotics and uh, the common ones are beta lactam narrow um, narrow spectrum uh, along with amino glycosides so we again have little bit consensus uh, conflict here if the patient who is born in hospital coming from neonatal icu usually they get narrow spectrum which is like uh, penicillin penicillin and um, and uh, gentamicin whereas if the patient is born outside the hospital and coming straight to a pediatric surgeon then they go for broad spectrum antibiotics which is ampicillin and uh, gentamicin so these are the common uh, drugs we use and for anaerobe obviously we add on uh, flagel which is metronidazole we have to be very little careful about the doses uh, which is uh, dependent on their age what about other drugs you'd like to give before surgery like um, say do you give vitamin k other things that you would give a neonate before they came for surgery so if neonates are coming usually if they are born in hospital everywhere they get the first dose of vitamin k which is 1 mg usually if they have not got it then pre surgery we do give them uh, vitamin k apart from that because they are fasted uh, pre operatively so 10% extrose or 5% extrose depending on the condition of a neonate uh, is been started um, obviously they don't get sedatives they don't get unnecessary analgesics but if they are intubated or they um, if they are intubated then obviously they get sedation and analgesic on top of uh, the other drugs these are the two drugs generally we get dex uh, dextrose and Uh, vitamin K is not What given. Sedatives? Do you give usually to the ventilated neonate? They get fentanyl, which is uh, both uh, sedative and analgesic. Okay, Ramesh. Most of the neonates have murmurs on auscultation. How do we decide whether they are significant clinically? actually this is a very uh, difficult question but uh, i think this uh, this question should have gone to lakshmi kumar who is the uh, wife of a pediatric uh, well known cardiologist i don't know how the this question has come to me we'll ask her also we'll ask her okay. <laughs> 
But what I will, I'll tell, this is a very, uh, very difficult question. I, even the cardiologist cannot answer. That's what I feel. Because if there is, if you have a murmur and the child may not have a major cardiac problem. If there is no murmur, the child may have a life-threatening cardiac problem as well. So whether having a murmur or no murmur doesn't actually, it is very, very important for us to do clinical uh, judgment. So what I feel is there's no murmur, most of the time it is normal. If there's a murmur, it could be a physiologically normal murmur or it could be an abnormal uh, murmur. But older child, I used to teach people that if it is more than one year child, then if it is a left-sided murmur, it's along with the thrill, if it is diastolic murmur with the cardiomegaly, then it could be a, a pathological. But in case if it is a neonate, I don't think these things can be done. So I feel that you need a pulse oximetry. If the pulse oximetry will definitely tell about 30 to 40 percent of congenital anomalies can be a pulse oximetry of synaptic heart disease. And second, do the pulse, uh, uh, feeling the pulse in the upper limb and the femoral pulse. I think if you put the femoral pulse, I think you'll have a coarctation can be a little avoided. But if there's a PDA is present, the femoral pulse can be present. It takes about 10 days for or three, four days for the PDA to close. Then the femoral coarctation will be diagnosed clinically. That means 40% of the time, we will be able to say clinically the child is a little pathological or not. Other thing I heard also, and I'm also very happy that if the child has a murmur, that means the child is very unlikely to go to pulmonary hypertensive crisis. What we are worried as a non-cardiac anesthetist epidetics that if the child is going to pulmonary hypertensive crisis, then we are in trouble. So if there's a murmur, we are happy something is there to flow. So we have a pulmonary hypertension. It's not there. That I'm just talking about clinically. And we are happy with that. So the second thing is, if there's a murmur is there, most of the time, if the murmur is used to say when you were studying initially, the murmur is huge and then low and uh, very loud, that means the hole is small and the child is all right. If the murmur is very mild, they are sicker child. I think that's a very important for the postgraduate to find out by auscultation what exactly to be done. And after all these things, just I feel that the neonates somehow manage whether murmur or not, and cardiologically, they're very, very stable. I think that's a very important. And I feel that if you murmur or not murmur, and if you feel you please err on doing an echo than not doing an echo, because that will not to postpone or not. We know exactly what type of, uh, you know, it's a left to right shunt or left to right shunt, or if we are going to get problems. I think if you're in doubt, please do the echocardiogram. I think these things are... Uh, Ramesh, one thing... are very difficult to really say whether it is pathological or I think it's uh, physiological. Ramesh, one uh, couple of things we need to highlight for the postgraduates. Yeah. It's difficult to make out a murmur in a neonate because they all have tachycardia. And to find a murmur, many of us tend to miss it because of the tachycardia. The second thing is, if you want to do an echocardiogram, find a cardiologist who can interpret a pediatric echocardiogram. Someone who does an occasional echocardiogram or does it in adults will have a problem. So um, what I feel, what you said is very, very right. You can use a pulse oximeter. Use a pulse oximeter on the upper limb and on the lower limb. The pulse oximeter itself will tell you if there is a difference. Then you can go by the history, go by clinical signs. Does anyone else want to add anything, Lakshmi? Now that you are in the hot seat. <laughs> hey, I wanted to say that, that uh, we find it very difficult to pick up murmurs. And we go clean, like, you know, occasional circumstances when it's semi-emergent and your Saturday, the child is pink and the saturation is good, we take. Otherwise, an echo is asked for. And uh, most of the time they pick up, but even then, sometimes they miss some lesions which are picked up later. So I guess it's a very challenging field. And we go by what Dr. Ramesh said. Pink saturation. Yeah. Yes, I, yeah, no, just a, some practical problems that I faced uh, you know, if I have a very dark skinned baby and uh, uh, you can't, you can't just say, you know, is this child cyanotic or not? Um, then and sometimes you might be dealing with the tetralogy of fallow 
and you um, sometimes what happens are very often you induce a baby's moving around the pulse ox doesn't work so you say oh it's not working and you might be actually have a saturation of 80 so oh, it can't be it must be something else and then you ignore it and and you know this has happened i've seen it happen on two occasions where with the child actually uh, desaturated post op and then when they uh, did an x ray and they did an echo uh, they found that it was a phallostatology and the anesthesiologist didn't believe the pulse oximeter. So where you're talking about it, how it's so important that if you think it's not working, change the pulse oximeter. And if there is continues to be a persistent problem, believe it and then say, okay, I'm dealing with a, a, a problem. Thank you. Uh, Elsa, the next question is for you. What would you okay. consider basic monitoring for a neonate undergoing emergency surgery? And what is the acceptable SpO2 in the newborn? Well, I think, I mean, when you would say basic, I think it should be standardized everywhere. If you're dealing with a neonate, you should be able to have the basic monitoring of blood pressure with a suitable sized cuff, whether it's for a premature baby or for a, a term baby, they will be different. You need to have um, a pul two pulse oximeters, as you very rightly said, one in the foot, and one in the right upper limb, preferably. And why so? Because again, if there is, let's say, um, a PDA, for instance, with it likely to be, it might reopen, you would then know if there is a shunting. Like the child may not be shunting when you induce, and then you have a rise in pulmonary arterial pressures, and then they start shunting, then you will pick it up early. So it's important to have two pulse oximeters, lower limb and right upper limb, not left upper limb. And then we're talking about temperature monitoring, which we all know is very important, and uh, ECG. And it's important to have the small uh, stickers, not the big ones, so that you know they cover the whole chest. And I still believe that it's worthwhile having a stethoscope. If you have a esophageal stethoscope, nothing like it. Very gently introduce it, and then you don't have another big plaster on the chest. So we're talking about ECG, uh, heart rate, uh, with the and uh, we're talking about pulse oximeter. And in my mind, you have to have an ETCO2. It's so important in we, we might miss a tube slipping out and or uh, just going into the esophagus. You might think you're still ventilating, but actually it's just come out and it's at the level of the glottis. So that in my mind is so important. But more than anything else, Rebecca, I think, you know, you have to, you have to have a very vigilant anesthesiologist who's clinically, uh, knows what to look for, is positions him or herself at a level so he can see the child, he can see the monitor and he can see what's happening so that he can correlate all three at one time, have access to touch the child so you can have a finger on the radial pulse and also see what the hand looks like in terms of perfusion. I don't know if anybody wants to add anything else. If it's very major surgery, I might go ahead, put in a, a, a catheter and uh, um, a monitor, and if and if for something like a CDH, I might put in an arterial line as well. So, Ekta, what is the acceptable SpO two in the newborn? Oh, okay, that's for Ekta. No. No, unless you want to answer. Elsa. No, I don't mind passing the buck. <laughs> so um, uh, we um, should look for the baseline number and should stay there. Any, uh, so we should not add on FiO2 trying to get 100% saturation. Um, anything near baseline or not less than 90. Probably books do mention 88 to 92, but I think not less than 90. 90 but I think important to, is to stay around the baseline value. What about considering peak airway pressures? In an intubated child, would you uh, want to check your peak airway pressures? Lakshmi? Okay. Yes, um, um, I'm not quite sure in what context uh, we are talking of it in the ICU or in the OR. No, no, emergency surgery in the OR. OR. So uh, basically, I think we, um, by default, anywhere where the abdomen is distended or if it's a thoracic uh, emergency, we would consider a pressure control volume guarantee and definitely look at the peak pressure. 
So we kind of extrapolated to what the ventilatory settings would be used in the ICU. Like if we are taking a child who's already on a ventilator, we look at the peak pressure there and try to keep it at the same. Otherwise, we try to target the lowest pressure that is giving us reasonable control of CO2 and adjust with the rate to try within the peak pressure. So somewhere less than 25 definitely would be a target. The lungs are very compliant, perhaps less than 20 would be good. Thank you. Uh, sorry. Ekta, what are the signs and symptoms of anaphylaxis in a neonate? I think this is a di difficult one. Um, so, um, because neonates, their immune system is immature. Um, I have never seen any anaphylaxis in neonate. And uh, we had a discussion with the uh, neonatologist earlier. Um, I think one of the experienced anesthesiologists also has not seen any, any anaphylaxis. And uh, there is no mention anywhere say, saying that you cannot see anaphylaxis. But the thing is, uh, I've not even read a case report anywhere for anaphylaxis. So I don't know that. I answer. didn't give you this question. The question came from the organizers. So okay. whoever that is, shoot him. <laughs> <laughs> so I haven't I seen an that. anaphylaxis in a neonate. Yeah. So I think physiologically it should not happen because their immune system till three months is quite immature to uh, cause anaphylaxis. But I am not sure, so sure. Thank you. Lakshmi, can you describe the post-op ICU management of a baby, say with gastroschisis, whose abdomen has been closed with a silo? Ma'am, uh, your lecture was so beautiful and you did cover a part of it, so I don't have too much to add. If a baby's abdomen has been closed with silo, it means that they have not been able to push the contents inside, either because of edema or if the content is pushed, it causes so much of pressure that blood flow to the internal organs is compromised. So meticulous asepsis, perhaps vigilance towards the color of the bowel that you see from outside. And um, I don't know, you know, in, when we did CDH, there is a, a senior surgeon who used to look at abdom, uh, urinary uh, bladder pressure as a surrogate of intra-abdominal pressure. But uh, when I checked with the neonatologist, they don't seem to be uh, following that so much. And as a person who's done a lot of abdominal surgery, I know the emphasis in abdominal compartment seems to have come down over the years, perhaps because we are more aware and are preempting the happening of that. So mm -hmm. for this, I would just mention perhaps that the looking at the color to make sure pressures, uh, you don't give any CPAP where the bowels can actually distend and contribute to increase pressure. And uh, you correct any fluid losses like uh, with albumin or something that will help reduce bowel edema. And Perhaps one can consider monitoring intra-abdominal pressure either through intragastric or uh, intravesical bladder pressure. Uh, the thing is that over time, they decrease the size of the silo so that the bowel tends to slowly fill up the abdomen. And then over time, only they think about closing the abdomen. They don't do anything very dramatically or push the child into a... Because if the diaphragm, if it gets pushed up and is splinted, then you will not be able to wean them off ventilators. So that is that was the main thing that they have to think about. Uh, Ramesh, what is your opinion on the usefulness of rigid bronchoscopy prior to anesthesia for tracheoesophageal fistula? Uh, Ma'am, actually, this uh, I was uh, first 20 years of my pediatric anesthesia practice, uh, I was not doing uh, any rigid bronchoscopy and uh, just uh, clinically judged and positioned it, did the surgery, and somehow we managed, and some people, we, some of the uh, units we have lost. And uh, because of positioning of the tube, and then second time we have to reopen for a second fistula. Then uh, so many problems, I think, happen. But last 10 years, we have started uh, doing a rigid bronchoscopy and uh, uh, really found out those people we last about 20, uh, in those 20 years, some of them we last a TEF. Probably if you have done a bronchoscopy, we would have been more comfortable and we would have done better, uh, children would have been saved. That's what 
I feel right now, retrospectively uh, thinking. And uh, as far as the rigid bronchoscopy, it looks like actually initially we were doing a little bit of bronchoscope, but the lower, smaller bronchoscope is slightly, what happened was slightly little bigger. So what we have done is we have taken the telescope of the bronchoscope and tried to do and spontaneously spray the cards. And before um, uh, you start doing a trick of putting the tube, we just examine the carina and then bring it out, bring or see the fistula and see the size of the fistula, where it is, and we can position the tube. We also found out a lot of tracheomalacias. We have found out the double fistulas. And uh, we also put a catheter in the fistula to identify during the surgery. And initially, ENT surgeon used to help us. But now, as anesthesiologists, we are able to do it because it takes about five minutes to just have to look into it, and then we can measure. Actually, because Dr. Le uh, Rebecca, uh, Madam asked me and just message me, they're going to ask questions. If you allow me, I can screen, uh, I can share my screen about the scopes uh, if you agree with me. I just wanted the postgraduates to know why this question came up. Yeah. It is mainly because as uh, Ramesh rightly said, you may not have only a single tracheoesophageal fistula. There may be a second Multiple. fistula. There may be tracheomalacia, which you make out only on spontaneous respiration. Once you give a muscle relaxant, you can't make out tracheomalacia. So on spontaneous respiration with local anesthesia, if you go in, it may be you doing the rigid scopy, maybe uh, the surgeon doing the scopy, whoever it is, will go deep in up to the carina and as they withdraw, check for the opening of the uh, fistula in the posterior part. Fistula usually occurs in the muscular part of the trachea. It doesn't occur where the cartilages are. So you look for it at the posterior aspect and also look for the movement of the cartilage to see if there is tracheomalacia. Yes, uh, Ramesh, I will stop sharing and you may share your screen. Okay, this is just, uh, I, I, could, I couldn't get all the, how we are doing it, but I just want to update because what I have done about 20, if you think back, I think uh, I just learned in last 10 years, so I'll just share if possible. Are you able to see that? Is it okay? Yes. yes. This is just, uh, I just about four, I'll just finish fast, not much, it's just uh, uh, looking at the scope with the telescope. That's for that we can see the with the telescope, looking down spontaneous like Dr. Rebecca, just induced with CO fluorine, sprayed with the local anesthetics. When you are spraying the local anesthetic, please be careful with the dosages because you may spray a little more. So you just make sure two persons are like, and don't spray with the four persons are like, and with the four, two persons are like, and then you do like this. Slowly, you can see the vocal cords are moving, go nicely down. As you see here, you can see this is a going for the, the tracheomalacia. See this full of tracheomalacia. And uh, the, if you go down, you can down, you can see the fistula. As Dr. Rebecca said, there's a huge fistula. This is a tracheomalacia with the posterior aspect. You see, what this one is, many times postoperatively, the surgery is done very well and we are not able to extubate. We thought it's maybe a tracheomalacia, but if you approve preoperatively, then we can show that wait for about a week or 10 days before slowly you take on second. We can also tell the prognosis to the patient parents. It is not because of surgery, it could be because of tracheomalacia, because trichophysia fistula is formed because some abnormality in the tracheal formation. So it is not something is associated condition. It is the actually a fistula because of the tracheomalacia as well. So I think it is not the question of surgery. It is the tracheomalacia. It takes a long time to do it. I'll do another one. This is a huge proximal, very, very, there's a proximal fistula where sometimes the, so when you saw it, it's very proximal. When the surgeon goes in the usual incision, the lower side, then they may not be able to see the fistula. So very mm. difficult, exactly. Then keep on searching, where is the fistula? Where is the fistula? But once this is, we know that it's very proximal, then you will do an incision a little, a little higher level than the usual uh, thing. It's a good idea to do a fistula and find out what it is uh, being done. Ramesh, in that case, it may even be nice to put in a, 
uh, a very fine guide wire into that fistula so that the surgeon can feel it when they open the chest. This I'm showing now, madam. This is now I'm showing that. You can see this is the one. We can see this is where we are, what we are doing it. We are seeing the fistula here. This is proximal, same child. What we are doing is with the help of, a, because bronchoscope is very difficult. We have done with the cystoscope, with the, uh, uh, what the fulgurating, uh, fulgurating cystoscope, which is 6.5. With that, mm -hmm. with the help of the Fogarty, the catheter, we just put it inside. And then so that when it's inside, then we put endotracheal tube. So when the operator, the surgeon is able to find out the scope. Not only the quiet we have done is that in the Fogarty catheter, we put it distally, then we inflate it, then the pullet, so that the, the proximal and distal part of the trachea come closer so that they can suture it. I think a, a lot of things we learned by this particular uh, type of uh, technique. The other one is, I just want to show you, when you put this one, we when you put the scope, we see where is the carina, then in that particular scope, I mark it, then I pull it out slowly when the fistula I mark it. At the end of it, the vocal cord I mark it. Then I know how much of the endotracheal tube tip can be put between. You see a nice diagram given by Rebecca. There's a nice written diagram where there is a vocal cord. Next is the um, uh, fistula. Next is the carina. So if you know exactly what length you can keep the tip, you know it's easier. Otherwise, we have to auscultate, pull it out, pull it in. Then I think this is a very good. I'll show you one important video which where we are able to do it very nicely. We can do it. Other one which I very rarely we have seen here is that there is a fistula and one of the from other hospital shifted here because they said they are not able to put the tube. So immediately mm. what we did is we did a scope and we did endoscope. When we did a proroscope and we found it is associated with the subglottic stenosis. So we are not able to push the tube at all. So immediately, so as soon as the subglottic stenosis and fistula is again, so immediately that particular set itself, we did a tracheostomy and then we did a tracheoisal fistula. After three years, the child came and did a tracheal reconstruction. I think all these children, if you have not the, done the scope, you would have lost sure. those people. So I think this is what we have learned. Uh, so I'm really happy that uh, Rebecca messaged me that they're going to ask this because uh, we all learned. I think we should do it. So, and we think, I used to think when you're doing a bronchoscopy, a neonate, oh, big procedure, oh, it's a lot of things. And uh, there'll be pneumothorax. I think if you start doing it, I think it's a fairly a simple, not that I'm in a simple procedure, but you should have a proper equipment. And initially we have an ENT surgeon by the side who can really help us out a little bit. But the problem is to get an ENT surgeon period at the same time, coordinate in a private place is difficult. So you can start doing it. I think it's Ramesh, amazing. if you're uh, lucky, if you're lucky to have a very small rigid bronchoscope, it is useful because you can maintain the respiration. Oxygenation through the side arm can be done. That is, if you're lucky to have a very fine very small scope, rigid, yeah, yeah, yeah. Rigid scope. If you don't have it, then you have to think laterally. You have to think of alternatives. Like you said, you may use a cystoscope. You may use only the telescope. Uh, stelescope. <laughs> it will be different. Yeah. But if you are lucky to have uh, this, it's fine. There was one question in the chat box which came up, which says, would you use a cuffed endotracheal tube in a patient? Uh, use of cuffed ET tubes in neonates, especially in thoracic surgery, in the lateral position. Uh, do any of the panelists want to get involved in this? Yes, Ekta. So um, um, we are still using uncuffed tube for these uh, babies. Uh, fairly re reason for that is because neonate is not very happy to have them with cuffed tube. But I think I will go for cuffed tube provided I have a manometer and I can measure cuff pressure and keep it. I think it also depends on the type of cuffed tube. Yeah, micro cuff. It yeah, has only to be micro cuff. cuff, and it has to be the distance yeah. from the cuff to the tip has to be a non-beveled tip. Yeah, yeah. Then maybe you would consider it. Yeah, yeah. only yes. micro cuff, ma'am. Ma'am, I just wanted to add to Dr. Ramesh's thing. Um, very uh, informative, sir has shown all that videos. We also are doing actually for last five years the fiber optic. We are doing with fiber optic because we have it. Um, so we are doing, but is very useful. We had many, like sir has shown many videos. We have many situations where actually the uh, the fistula was actually in right bronchus, not 
nowhere near in trachea so many oh. times we ruled out tracheomalacia with this fiber optic vision and then we had one case where the whole approach to the surgery was changed because the as sir said the fistula was very very proximal so actually they went cervically rather than thoracic so that's uh, what is the uh, anesthetic management when you use a fiber optic scope so we put in when they come we leave them spontaneous uh, or psp pro not uh, exceeding 10 cm of water uh, put in lma and through lma we do this um, we only doing it and uh, that's about it we so, uh, if we so have anesthesia is uh, it's sevoflurane oxygen uh, it's diva ma'am mostly it's diva diva dexmed it's dexmed it mean so lma with dexmed it mean okay any more questions that have come ma'am there is there, there are a few more questions in the chat box ma'am if it's okay can we take them yes up? yes Yes. Uh, Dr. Vinayat, I I feel that bronchoscope pre-op tracheal fistula you will become a standard of care. That's what I want to tell you. It is not because child trust is having or CMC is doing. I think that's all going not going to be there in a specialized center. I feel pre-operative bronchoscopy or telescope you will become the standard of care in as far as the management of tracheal fistula. Yeah, thank you, sir. Ma'am, there are a few more questions in the chat box. Uh, if you yes. like, uh, what is the in induction in induction of choice uh, in neonates? Anybody want to answer that? Lakshmi is keeping quiet. I know. <laughs> <laughs> This one's for Lakshmi. <laughs> um. again it would depend upon the type of surgery that the child is coming for so if there's something where uh, you actually want to keep the child a breathing spontaneously then sevoflurane if it's uh, something like you're worried about aspiration then i would go for iv induction so there's nothing like what is the most uh, optimal it is something what you're most comfortable with i do use propofol i do use sevoflurane sometimes i use ketamine so uh, it's it's a matter of what you feel most comfortable with uh, so i wouldn't be able to say except there are situations when i want to keep the child breathing spontaneously i would go for sevo and if it's an atresia or something i would do an uh, iv induction and a modified rapid sleep i hope that was clear enough i think uh, what you said is right it's an individual choice for an individual patient each patient is is different and we have to take each patient on their merits and demerits the next question please the next question would be ma'am uh, how do we measure intragastric pressure with a nasogastric tube you have a nasogastric tube in place you have to take the pressure on the nasogastric tube just like you do intravesical pressure with the bladder with a catheter you have to use a manometer on that uh, next one is on hypoglycemia hypoglycemia in neonates how different it is from adults and what about its management ramesh uh definitely i think uh, hypoglycemia is a very important uh, this one but what's important most of the time neonates Uh, they are all on dextrose. Most of them neonatal ward. They are all on dextrose. But in case they are coming for other ones, but the sugar is initially we used to tell that uh, uh, preterm the below twenty five and term below forty milligram per decilitre is the hypoglycemic level. Recently, I found whether it's a preterm or a term, it is forty milligrams. So I think it is not exactly twenty five milligram. More or less the, the definition of hypoglycemia neonate is less than 40 mg per ml under ml that is the uh, present uh, uh, definition though in pre time it is 25 term it's 40 i think that's a very important but when unless otherwise proved not what is an hypoxia if the child is really floppy i think think of hypoglycemia i think we have, that is why unless otherwise proved think of hypoglycemia in a, especially in a pre term and you don't mind giving little more of a dextrose don't get with the Help of a ten percent exos. If it is, a, you need only five percent exos enough to correct your uh, hypoglycemia. And you do your blood. If you are in doubt, 
please do the blood sugar. I think that's what it is. Don't assume that. Please do a blood sugar on the bedside. That's why in a neonate, if it's a major surgery, you do one side maintenance fluids with dextrose going on, and the other limb, you do a replacement uh, solution. If it is the question of pre-op fluids, we in all the uh, pediatrics, we are all thinking of dextrose or non-dextrose solutions for the maintenance. But one definite indication for using a dextrose sol solutions is in a neonate yeah. coming for a, even for hernia or anything, it is not, it should give with a dextrose solutions. People are saying about 5% or 2%. Both are quite okay with that, but you can no need to give 10% dextrose, but you can use with 5% dextrose or 2% dextrose with the ringer lactate. Both are all but right. One are, indication to give dextrose. With the neonate, uh, we may give a higher concentration. Of contrary, yeah, yeah. So in the older child, it's different. But for postgraduates, they must remember we are talking about replacement fluid separate from maintenance fluid. Maintenance. Yes. Um, any, are, yeah. are there any ET tube fixation formula for neonates? Fixation formula for neonates. Are you talking about the American children? Are you talking about the Indian children? You're talking about premature babies? You're talking about uh, nasal intubation? Talking this thing? I think... Um, you have to take all that into account. Does anybody want to take that? I think as per uh, you know the books, what we have learned is uh, one kg child, uh, one kg neonate means seven centimeter. That's a rough guide. Always it's a rough guide. You have to auscultate uh, once you have placed in the tube. Two kg eight centimeter and three kg nine centimeter. And you have to flex the head and extend yes, the head. You have to check it. All and... this, what you get from the books is Western literature. Yeah. So they're babies. Uh, but if you go by weight, it's different. 1 kg, 2 kg, 3 kg is not just a neonic. And also uh, about the fixation, I'm not sure what the question was. How do you fix it? I mean, one has to be very careful how you actually fix a tube because neonatal skin is very uh, uh, sensitive. And uh, I would go further to say if it's maybe a major surgery and you're planning to uh, not extubate this child, then there are some centers that prefer, the neonatologists prefer a nasal intubation. And then, you know, you have the weight of the uh, tube, which is much less than the equipment. And there are some people who would take the trouble to uh, tie a thread around the tube and then fix it on either on the forehead or here. And then so that you take the you may you need to ensure that the tube is not constantly pressing on the nostril, but is away from the skin. Otherwise, you can have uh, uh, excoriation. So that's also you need to really pay a lot of attention to detail when you're fixing a tube in a, uh, especially in a neonate. Thank you. So here, on a small practical point, I don't know what's happening is. Most of the fellows, I say, I say seven. When I fixate, they pull two more centimeter inside and then fixate when they are fixing it. So uh, they say, I fix at seven. When I see there and found right entry is there, oh, I fix at seven. I saw when you are fixing it, they'll push another couple of centimeters inside. I think when you are fixing it, you must hold that seven at yeah. the level of the lip. Please fix it, and then it's very important. So uh, many. So true. Uh, very common. No, I saw, I saw seven only, so, sir. So, so this is a, in a small baby. When you are fixing it, no, it will go another one centimeter inside. This is a very, so you must fix it exactly, hold it. So whenever I put a newborn in a preterm, I'll tell, I'll let me fix it. So I'll <laughs> fix it for this. Because once it's gone right side, this is, I think, important to fix it. Not just knowing seven, eight, nine, but please fix it at seven, eight, nine. Yeah. <laughs> the, um, the seven, eight, nine is for oral. Yeah, yeah. oral, yeah. Oral. yeah a little uh, more but what I have found is that when I leave the tube I have measured it fixed it I get one person to support the tube with the hand on the forehead and hold the tube in place I then get some black silk and tie loop it around the tube get in the knot lower down not near the nostril but the knot lower down and bring it on the side and whoever is now supporting the tube will hold that thread. That thread has to be tight and the thread has to be held tight. And then you can fix the adhesive, whatever. 
So even when you change the adhesive because that gets moist and then you that thread is there. You hold that thread. The thread makes sure that the tube doesn't move this way. So I have found that very useful. Each of us has a little uh, way of doing it and we stick to it. Any other questions? What sedation apart from sevoflurane for rigid or fiber optic bronchoscopy in units? We just heard dexmeritidomine. It was uh, an alternative which uh, has been used. Um, sevoflurane. I am still a halothane person. Okay. <laughs> It's not available. <laughs> there are a few comments, ma'am. Uh, microcuff tubes are recommended only for babies more than three kilograms as per manufacturers. Oh, the manufacturers write all sorts of things because they have to look after themselves because yeah. they are worried about uh, legal, legal problems. Whether it's drugs, whether it's the use of equipment, whether it's disposable, they won't let you use an eye gel a second time. Mm -hmm. How many of us use an eye gel once and throw it in the bin? We don't. So it's the manufacturer will put in whatever they are supposed to put in. We are a little more careful when it comes to those things. I think we have uh, answered most of the questions. Now, there was a question, can you use a fiber optic scope instead of rigid scope? I think already it was answered. Yes. There was one question on uh, subglottic stenosis. Yeah, management. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think as, as Dr. Ramesh said, these things can come up just out of the blue, not just with the tracheosophagus fistulas, but even for regular abdominal emergencies. We had a situation where they had two attempts at intubating with a three-size tube and couldn't get it in it. And that's when I was called in. And that is where Dr. Ekta's technique, where you put in a LMA, have a look with the fiber optic and then you'll be able to see there's a subglottic stenosis. And if you're lucky, unlike the situation where Dr. Ramesh described where they had to do a tracheostomy, you could then say go in with a 2.5 tube and then, uh, but then expect that you might have uh, some significant amount of group or problems post-op. So the, you, that's the, if, the, if you're suspecting that the tube is not going down, suspect uh, that there is a, so some uh, problem and have a look with the scope. And as Dr. Ramesh says, I, if you have a bronchoscope, use it. Use it for any patient who has any laryngeal issues, any thyroid issues, any upper airway issues, and you'd be surprised at how many other problems that you will be able to notice and, and pick up. Thank you. There's one um, suggestion saying that people have stopped using nasal intubation in neonates. Some hospitals have, some hospitals have not. Mm -hmm. Some neonatologists want a nasal intubation for uh, post-op ventilation, others do not. So I think we'll have to, it's a team, a team who works together and we have to see whether, what works best in that institution and in for that team. So thank you. And uh, there's another question, can uh, bronchoscopy for foreign body removal be done with flexible bronchoscope? This, um, today we are talking about neonates and neonatal surgical emergencies. Maybe we'll do foreign body bronchus another time. So we will tell the Kerala state people to think about foreign body bronchus another time. Thank you. Ma'am, ma'am, there's a question on fluid. What is the fluid of choice? I think Dr. Amish has answered that. Yes, he said for maintenance yeah. is different, for um, replacement is different. So uh, Ramesh has answered it. And if you want to go into great detail, then you'll have to um, talk about what the loss is. Like if you, uh, Lakshmi brought up the reason when you would may have to give colloids Others, maybe it is the loss of crystalloid. So each has to be done. In neonates, we give a higher concentration of dextrose and we will do repeat dextrose. The question for halothane for recurrent surgeries, ma'am, when we had nothing else, yes, we used halothane for every surgery. But now we don't have halothane at all. Please use sevoflurane because that's what you have. 
Ma'am, there's one more question. Uh, may you please explain how to do inhalational induction? How to do an inhalational induction? It's a question. Now, what do you want to do? Do you want to grab the child and take the child in and put the child on the bed and put a mask on his face and turn up SIBO for rain to 8% and frighten the child out of uh, his wits? Or do you want to do a steel induction? We are talking about neonates. Neonates, we are, they have no separation anxiety. We can bring them in. Those who are coming in for emergency surgery will have IVs in place. You could use some fentanyl and you could do a steel induction. There's no problem when you're doing neonates. When it comes to older children, well, that's a different ball game entirely and not for the scope of today's discussion. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Rebecca, ma'am, for that uh, excellent talk as well as for the discussion. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ekta, ma'am, Elsa, ma'am, Lakshmi, ma'am, and uh, Ramesh, sir, for taking mm -hmm. part in the uh, panel discussion. I think there are a few, I mean, not few, there are a lot of uh, eminent anesthesiologists who are watching this program. I think if Vinil allows them, they can put in a few comments. Of course, they can unmute and uh, make their comments. <laughs> Ah, Vinil, this is Dr. Meenakshi Sundaram. Vinil, Dr. Meenakshi Sundaram. Yes, sir, you are audible. Yeah, this is an excellent uh, session, and I should congratulate the ISA Kerala because you have brought in uh, eminent speakers all over the country who are well versed with pediatric anesthesiology. And I am happy to see Dr. Rebecca, Madam, and Dr. Elsa Vargis, Madam, after a long time. Other people we are routinely seeing and in teaching the interest, the passion towards pediatric anesthesiology is tremendous because uh, Dr. Ramesh, Dr. Ekta Rai and Dr. Lakshmi Madam, we are listening frequently. But these two, it is phenomenal. It is a, it is a great session. And see, I entered by 5.55 and I asked the beginning secretary to admit the secretary because he has not allowed us to join. So what I want to say, we are very much eager and this panel is very excellent, very, very excellent because it is, it is something unimaginable. Uh, I, so I was not waiting for any session. I have to request to Benil, congrats uh, the team, uh, the panelists and the ISA Kerala for the wonderful session. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Um, any other comments or uh, any other queries? I think we can ask the uh, panelists as uh, well as madam. Yeah, are... Hello. Hello. Yeah, please go on, sir. Yeah, Dr. Pankaj Gupta from Nasik, sir. Uh, yeah. Audible, sir. Yeah, absolutely excellent session. Learned a lot. Even though I've been doing this for the last 30 years. Uh, recently, just one comment I want to know about the experts think about. Uh, using uh, video laryngoscopy in neonates. I have started, just started doing it. I had discussed with Ramesh Ram when he was in ASIC about some time back. But uh, what is the opinion of the how easy is it? So I'm finding it pretty easy. So I just wanted to get a comment from the seniors. Use a video laryngoscope. Use a video laryngoscope for neonates. So we, we use CMAC uh, with neonate blade, straight blade for neonate, uh, for different okay. information. It's, um, so you need to get used to it. It is not difficult once you get, uh, when once you cross your learning uh, curve, then it's fairly okay to use. Okay, I, but I found it much easier than uh, adult intubation in the recent times. So I just thought whether everyone has an experience. Okay, uh -huh. I'm using... Uh, Initially, in learning curve, I have seen many of our postgraduates struggling, but once they cross okay. learning curve, it's okay to use. Okay. 
the be, the best part of video layering of scope and even it not many of uh, i don't know what blade and what type are using it i think only we have got uh, uh, mac 0 and uh, miller 1 and uh, there are only two available is uh, in as far as the c mac is concerned but like what we are telling is we are all learning probably we will we will be more than the uh, easy to intubate we might learn a lot of things by putting a laringa scope you might find something and associate it as cyst in that or you see the vocal palsy like a subglottic stenosis so you might learn more of things by video laringa scope i don't know whether we can compare a traditional laringa laringa scope along with the video video laringa scope or easy intubation in a neonate i think that will never come that comparison will never come but whether that will be a you see the norm of uh, adult itself the video laringa scope is becoming a norm for or even uh, when, uh, the convention is going to go in neonatal video layering of scope is uh, not going to come for another 10 to 15 year the reason is that the now only the research is going on as for neonatal video layering of scope especially d blade recently has come so difficult intubation neonate is very 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 rare i i i feel that it is not that i am an expert well, but it's very rare when uh, there is a um, couple of things one is when you use a video layering of scope yes. Uh, especially if you're using it in a pair robin a, a very severe pair robin or treacher collins uh, then maybe a video laryngoscope would have a, a place but in the video laryngoscope you're looking directly at the glottis you're missing out the rest of the mouth which is what i feel sometimes we miss out on the big picture and uh, so we actually look at both not just um... actually what i am using madam is a medicam uh, company this uh, it comes with 12 video uh, 12 blade different blades it has right from a neonatal blade um, uh, miller 1 2 3 the macintosh blade then the uh, flexitib blades and yes, but, uh, we, but basically we are not using all those blades for one case you decide yeah. before you start the case what you are going to use you use that and then you go yeah. ahead So, yeah, so there is a variety that is there but what my um, thing is that we when you use a video laryngoscope you are using it for a difficult intubation or you are trying to get a tube into the glottis now <laughs> in our other way of yeah. doing a regular laryngoscopy you are seeing the whole mouth you are seeing the fossas you are looking on either side you may find some other pathology very rarely but you may find something so i am just playing devil's advocate i am playing the other thing we sometimes bend over backwards when it comes to all the equipment and all the fancy things forgetting what life was like so actually after after covid i started uh, more of your laryngoscopy distinct from after covid and i am i finding it much easier than the regular scope that's why i thought like let's see whether everyone else is having the same opinion or not Yeah, definitely, sir. You see yeah, a video layer yeah. scope. You see the vocal cords. You see the big monitor. That is exactly. uh, what more you want. Yeah, uh, struggling and putting a scope like this and doing like this. Uh, I think if you see that, that, that is uh, logically it's going to be a good uh, easy to do. It all depends upon your individual uh, thing. Yeah. And if you see the other side, I tried video layer scope. Sometimes I difficult. I take a normal video layer scope. I have intubated. <laughs> so this is uh, some it happens like that. So individual, you are happy. ஒரே Thank you, ma'am. If there are no more questions, I think we'll wind up the session. On behalf of IISA Kerala State, I would like to thank uh, Rebecca, ma'am, for that excellent uh, presentation on neonatal emergencies. I should thank all the panelists. Like thank for, I should thank all the panelists yeah, for wish, agreeing sir. to answer the questions I put out for them. So, uh, <laughs> thank you very much for answering. Your You are a tough examiner, madam. Better I know. <laughs> tough, uh, tough examiner, you know. It's uh, <laughs> I don't know how the CMC people were uh, uh, managing. Good, I didn't join you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Before we move on to the next session, uh, we would like to announce the uh, schedule for the next week. Uh, next week, we have uh, two topics. One is a lecture. Lecture is on uh, long-term complications of endotracheal intubation, prevention and management by Dr. Anita Nileshwar, who is professor and former HOD of Department of Anesthesiology at KMC Manipal. This will be followed by a case discussion on microlaryngeal surgery. The, uh, the PG resident is from Amala Institute of Medical Sciences, Trishur, and she's Dr. Devika Venugopal. And the examiners are Dr. Namrata Rendanath, who is professor and head of the Department of Anesthesiology at Kidwai Memorial Institute of Oncology, Bangalore. And uh, Dr. Paul Raphael, who is the professor and head of the Department of Anesthesiology at Amala Institute of Medical Sciences. So next week at uh, six o'clock, uh, please do join us for this uh, two wonderful sessions. And over to the next talk. And to join ISA Kerala PG update, uh, please do send a WhatsApp message. And uh, we move on to the next session. And the next session is by is on for anesthesia for fetal surgeries. And that's going to be uh, delivered by Dr. Rika Ogis, who is Professor of Anesthesia at uh, Dr. Vijish, you are not audible. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Maybe some network issues. Yeah, now we recommend uh, the next talk is on anesthesia. Yeah, and the next talk is on anesthesia for fetal surgery by to be delivered by Dr. Rekha Vagris, who is the uh, professor of anesthesiology at uh, Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences, Kuchin. Over to ma'am for her talk on fetal anesthesia. Uh, shall I start uh, sharing yeah, the screen? Please. Yeah, yes. please, ma'am. Yeah. Please do share. Yeah. So thank you for uh, giving me this invitation. Uh, good evening to everybody. The talk is on anesthesia for fetal surgery. Fetal surgery has come a long way in the last 30, 40 years. And most of the work has been done by a doctor called Michael Harrison. This Michael Harrison, he works at the University of California and he has, uh, he's really interested. His interest was, you know, his interest speaked during his student days itself when he wondered why all these children, all these babies should be born with such bad defects and can't, can't anything be done for them inside the, when they are in the fetal stage itself. This interest he carried on throughout, throughout his career. As his career unfolded, he kept his interest and worked towards a resolution of this problem that he wanted to solve. And as luck would have it, he is also called the father of fetal surgery. And as luck would have it, there were several advances in this field which helped him at this time. People became more knowledgeable about the natural history of these fetal defects which meant that they knew they, uh, which one is going to end with the morbidity or which one is going to end with a serious morbidity and which one is going to lead onto a mortality. They also knew about the pathophysiology of the diseases, which made it easier to tackle it at an early stage. And the other advances such as uh, a better ultrasound machines, which would give more details earlier and development of uh, good surgical instruments sophisticated techniques, and even improvement in surgery and anesthesia, all this helped. Uh, are, are you able to hear what I'm saying? Hello? Yes, ma'am. You're audible. Yeah, okay. okay You're audible, ma'am. Yeah, thank you, thank you. So um, also the ability to do experiments on animals, that also contributed to a success of their uh, endeavor. And because it was successful, they could translate it and try it in human fetuses. If you were to say that, uh, we can say that we can divide the fetal procedures into mainly under three headings. The first would be the minimally invasive procedures. And after that comes the open mid gestation procedures. And then we have exit, 
or the ex utero intrapartum treatment, which is done towards late term. We'll go into details into each one. The first one, that is the minimally invasive procedures. Now, that is the most commonly performed in most of the fetal centers. In our institute, around 2,000 such procedures have already, more than 2,000 actually, has already been done. Most of this just requires uh, uh, to use an ultrasound and a needle, and they may not require anesthetic presence at all with a simple procedure. Then there, is a, there, are, there are procedures which require also a fetoscope to be used. So we can really see what we are doing, not just grainy gray and white images, but really we can see and do the procedure. So what are these in procedures which we do with just an ultrasound guidance and a needle? There is a percutaneous umbilical blood sampling known as pubs. Here what we do is under ultrasound guidance, I'll show the picture later. So I'll just enumerate the uh, the conditions that can be tackled with this minimally invasive procedure, just using the ultrasound and a needle. There's radio frequency ablation of uh, the umbilical cord for fetal reduction. You can do a balloon valvuloplasty. That is, if the if the child has got a critical aortic stenosis, that is going to uh, limit the development of the left ventricle. Under ultrasound guidance, you can guide the needle into the outflow tract of the left ventricle into the aortic valve, the stenosed aortic valve, and dilate it by, by inflating the balloon. The other thing that you can do is shun placements. If there are some cavities inside the baby, inside the fetus, which is too full of fluid, like a, a, a cecam with a macro cyst in the lung, or a, a bladder which is full of urine because there's a posterior urethral valve. You can put a shunt inside and so that uh, one end of the shunt is inside this cavity, fluid filled space in the body of the fetus, and one is outside in the amniotic space. So whatever uh, fluid excess is there can drain into the amniotic fluid. That also can be done just with an ultrasound and a needle. So this is a pictorial representation. You can see in the first picture, the percutaneous umbilical blood sampling. Under the guidance, the, the surgeon is trying to get some blood from the umbilical cord. This helps in uh, many diagnoses of certain underlying conditions, genetic abnormalities, hematological problems can be diagnosed. It can also be used as a treatment modality. If there is anemia developing in the baby due to whatever reason, RH problems, whatever reason, or a fetal maternal hemorrhage, Blood, the baby can be given blood transfusion to be life-saving for the baby. And it is a simple procedure where no anesthesiologist is required. Shunt placement here, it's not that simple a procedure, but it's again done on using just the ultrasound probe and a needle. Radio frequency ablation, that's a third picture. Here, if you have a twin, uh, if you have a baby who needs to be undergo fetal reduction, then with an ultrasound guidance and your radio frequency uh, probe, you can, uh, we can do this procedure. So when do you need an endoscope? When you put in an endoscope, you can actually see what you're doing. Such procedures are termed feet endo. That is, fetal endoscope is used in these procedures. What are these procedures? The most important and the one that springs to mind is a selective laser photocoagulation for twin to twin transfusion syndrome. We'll be going into detail, a little more detail about twin to twin transfusion syndrome a few slides later. Of course, then again, umbilical cord coagulation, you can do with the help of an endoscope, visualizing the umbilical cord and maybe using a bipolar cord. All this depends upon the, the, uh, uh, the size of the umbilical cord, what you use for uh, cauterizing or uh, coagulating the umbilical cord, depends on its size also. Then there is tracheal occlusion. In tracheal occlusion for CDH, what you're doing is you're trying to put a balloon into the trachea to block the egress of fluids which normally forms in a fetus lung. Around 100 ml per kg per day is the amount that is formed, which is quite sizable. So this amount, if you block it, it remains inside the lungs and makes the lungs bigger, appear bigger, and prevents the herniation of abdominal contents inside into the thoracic cavity, which happens in CDH. So that is uh, tracheal occlusion can be done as a minimally invasive procedure. There is amniotic band release and ablation of posterior urethral valves. I'll, I'll, uh, Go to the next slide, which shows the pictures of this. So this is a TTTS or twin to twin transfusion syndrome. Since we are going to talk about it in a little more detail, I'll skip to the next one. Here you can see the baby's body. There are so many amniotic bands around the baby's body. And if it's tight enough early on, you can see that the part that is distal 
becomes edematous because the blood flow, the venous flow is obstructed, the lymphatic flow is obstructed. And if it becomes any tighter, that lymph is going to be at risk. So these bands can be cut, but you can, you need a fetoscope to see, you have an ultrasound uh, on the baby, on the mother's abdomen under its guidance, you introduce the fetoscope and through the fetoscope, you can do cut the amniotic bands. And this is a, a picture of a, a tracheal balloon occlusion. The pediatric surgeon under the ultrasound visualizes the baby and introduce a fetoscope into the mouth of the baby and into the trachea. It is very, it requires a great degree of skill. Once it's introduced into the trachea, the balloon is deployed there to prevent aggressive fluid. This is done around 28 weeks of gestation and it's taken out at around 34 weeks of gestation. So uh, if we'll just take the twin to twin transfusion syndrome as a prototype of many other procedures that is done and I'll go into a little more detail about twin to twin transfusion syndrome, which is the commonest uh, condition that an anesthesiologist might, might see in minimally invasive procedures. Here, as the picture shows, you have got a, a single placenta that is a monochorionic uh, placenta monochorionic twin and you have got two amniotic sacs and it's seen the placenta is share, shared between the two babies you have one sac which is very big so it's polyhydramniotic the other sac is smaller and it's oligohydramniotic and the babies seem to differ in size so what is going on here we must realize that uh, this is not a very common condition. In monochorionic twins, only in 15% do you see this twin to twin transfusion syndrome. And only 1% of this ends up needing any intervention. So let's just look at the pathophysiology. If you look at this pathophysiology, you can see that uh, this is a placenta, and these are the two umbilical cords of the two twins attaching to the placenta. Now, uh, in the previous picture, we saw there's unequal sharing. Now, added, adding to this problem is another one. You can see that the vessels between the two, um, the umbilical vessels from between the two twins are connecting. There's abnormal connections between the two twins of these vessels. It happens on the surface and it happens on the deeper part of the placenta also. This sharing, these connections can be between a vein and a vein. On, from either side, maybe a vein to vein connection. Now the veins are the ones which are looking red because it's an umbilical vein which carries the oxygenated blood. Then you have the artery, umbilical artery, there may be an umbilical artery to artery connections. An artery which carries the used blood from the baby to the placenta is bluish. So it may be an artery to artery connection. Then you can have an artery to vein connection. There's an artery going to a vein. So what happens in artery to vein connection is that the blood flow always is going to be in one direction from the artery to the vein. Whereas an artery to artery connection or a vein to vein connection, it is bi-directional. It changes depending on the condition of the baby, but an artery to vein connection always is in one direction. So depending on the number of such anastomoses that exists between these two babies and the major direction of the resultant flows in this, there will be more blood flow to one baby you can see that's, what it ha that's what's happened here. There's more blood flow to one baby and that baby is having hypovolemia and producing more urine and leading on to polyhydramnios. Whereas the other baby is getting, not getting so much blood. So she is not producing as much urine and this baby is oligohydramniotic. So if, if it ended with that, it would have been fine, but that's not the end of the story. As this baby has to pump, has to deal with more blood volume, the baby starts getting cardiomyopathy, hypertensive cardiomyopathy. Now, it's not only this baby that's having a problem. This other baby who is not getting enough blood is trying to conserve all this blood and to send it to more important areas like the brain and the heart. So the kidneys cannot produce much urine now. It's all being saved for other places. And finally, even the bladder cannot be seen because there's no urine for, to fill the bladder. So that is the next stage in these babies. And then you see when you use the Doppler, the umbilical arteries, the umbilical vessels, the, there's a change in the blood flow in the umbilical artery, umbilical vessels. That's again another stage. That's the progression. That's how it's progressing. And then you notice that these baby, one of the baby or both the babies can have cardiac failure, develop high drops and may end in the demise of one or both babies. So it's a pretty serious condition which needs to be treated. So these stages which I described earlier, 
going on from this oligohydramnios, a polyhydramnios to absent bladder in one twin to, the, to Doppler changes in the blood flow to development of hydrox and finally demise it's a quintero staging. And depending on this, when you see the patient, depending on the stage at which they are, you have to plan your procedure. And the procedure usually, if it's an early, early detection, then serial amnioreduction. You can take the amniotic fluid from the baby, which is polyhydramniotic, and that might help. But when you, if you see the ba babies a little later, then really you'll have to go in for the definitive procedure, which is called the selective laser photocoagulation of these abnormal collections. So a small uh, video, I'll try to play it. Now, what is happening here is, uh, the surgeon is uh, under ultrasound guidance, is passing the fetoscope inside and using the fetoscope, this is the fetoscopic view. He is viewing the amniotic fluid and he's entered the amniotic chain, the, the amniotic sac of the bigger twin, the recipient twin. And he is looking at all these abnormal, like the, he's looking at the connections, vascular connections on the placenta and he'll find the vascular equator. The vascular equator means where the two, the blood vessels, from both the twins meet and where the abnormal connections happen. So he identifies the abnormal connections and he selectively lasers these connections or separates out these connections. So this would help in saving sometimes both the babies or at least one baby can be saved by this. If it's not done, if no intervention is done at this point, there's a high chance of fetal demise. So if you catch this patient pretty late where well, one twin is really at risk, then maybe your choice is only radio frequency ablation of the umbilical cord of the twin who is at risk. So you do a fetal, you may have to do a fetal reduction there. Because if you allow uh, one fetus to, to uh, die naturally, it's not that the other one is going to survive. The other one may also have neurological damage. At the time of death of one twin, there's precipitous fall in the blood pressure of that baby, of that fetus. And because there are fetal connections in the placenta, blood is going to flow from one twin to the other twin with the lower pressure. And that may cause a, a reduced blood flow to the brain for some time and lead on to neurological damage in the surviving twin. Moving on to the next slide. Uh, so if you treat it, it's fine. Sometimes even if you treat it, there's a problem can still occur. Here, uh, here I'm, uh, this is where the, the, uh, the, uh, the surgeon has laser, laser coagulated the abnormal vessels. Sometimes if they miss a, a few vessels, which are uh, which, uh, the abnormal connections, the problem might be that slow flow might go on occurring from one twin to the other. And gradually with time, one twin becomes anemic and the other twin will have, the, will have polycythemia. And this also is not going to end well. And you may have to do a fetal reduction by doing a radio frequency ablation. I'll talk about the anesthesia for this together with all the other procedures. We'll just go through the different conditions that are uh, seen under the three headings that I said. So we, now this is a minimally invasive procedure we are talking about. And the frequently seen condition is called twin reverse arterial perfusion or otherwise known as a trap. Here, what is happening is like you again have a monochorionic, di monochorionic diamniotic babies. And if you notice, you can see that one twin has no heart or head. So it is a cardiac, this is a cardiac twin, no heart. So where is the blood supply coming from? It is a pump twin. This tw twin is supplying the blood to the cardiac twin too. So that is okay initially, but as this baby grows, the heart of this baby is finding it tough work to meet, to give blood to this baby also. So what happens? This baby's heart goes into failure and can go into high drops and death. So only thing that you can do is to do a radio frequency ablation and cauterize this umbilical vessel. So that is about the minimally uh, invasive procedures. Then we move, move, then we move on to the open mid-gestation fetal surgeries. The one that springs to mind and which is most commonly done outside is the repair of myelomeningocele defect. That has got very good prognosis. So that is uh, one that is done in as an open mid-gestation procedure. So in some centers in America, they are also doing petoscopically, but that's in very few centers. Generally, it is open. 
Then if you have the fetus as large fetal lung masses, which is pressing on the mediastinum or, um, or it is causing, uh, may cause high drops and it cannot wait till the baby is born to deal with it because the baby might die of high, die of high drops. Then you have to go in for an open procedure in these babies also. The same goes for very big sacrococcygeal teratomas. If they're very big, the blood flow that they, this sacrococcygeal mass requires also is very high, which means great work for the heart. And the heart can also go in for failure. So these sacrococcygeal teratomas also we need to do uh, um, uh, open gestation procedures may have to be done for deep for the debulking of the sacrococcygeal teratomas. And the procedure was vesicostomy for lower urinary tract obstructions, known as lower urinary tract obstruction as the short form is luto. But nowadays it's not favored as much. But instead, for this, what they do is a minimally invasive procedure whereby they go through the bladder of the fetus using a field endoscope and they just uh, they uh, destroy the posterior urethral valve through, through a feet and procedure. That's a fetal endoscopic procedure, minimally invasive procedure. That is what is being done now. There is a third category, which is the ex utero intrapartum treatment. This is performed close to term gestation as opposed to the open mid gestation procedures. Here, if you allow the baby to be born normally, you may have an emergency in your hand, which you may not be able to deal with effectively. You may have a, a surgical emergency or emergency which is life-threatening. So to make this situation more, more um, a, a stable situation, where you, you have time to deal with it, that's what is the whole idea be, behind the exit procedure. Because here the baby is supported by the placenta of the mother. The mother's placenta supplies the, gases, the oxygen, gives the oxygen, removes carbon dioxide, gives nutrition, all that goes on when the patient is on placental support. That's why it's called intrapartum treatment. And here, what is needed for the survival of the baby is done with the baby still on the placental supply. And mainly, the main indication for this exit procedures are when there are large masses or large oropharyngeal or neck masses, which will make an intubation, trickle intubation after delivery difficult. Or it may be a congenital high airway obstruction syndrome. As the name indicates, it just means high up in the, in the trachea, there may be an obstruction so that whatever, uh, how, whatever you do, you will not be able to put a tube in this baby after delivery because it's totally obstructed. This can be diagnosed by the neonatologist, by the perinatologist or the maternal field a medicine specialist when they do an ultrasound because they'll see that the lungs are big because the trachea is occluded and the fluid that is being produced in the lungs cannot come out. So the trachea is occluded. The lungs tend to become very big and the diaphragm is flattened. It loses its shape, convex shape and becomes flattened. So the diagnosis can be made by ultrasound during the you know, during early on, and you can plan for an exit to airway. That's the tracheostomy. Exit to airway here would be a tracheostomy. If the patient has severe micro, micrognathia, which makes uh, intubation dip impossible after birth, then again, in these babies also, tracheostomy, exit to airway, or uh, exit to tracheostomy becomes an option. It's not only exit to airway that is done as exit procedures, you can also do exit to resection. Suppose there's a large lung mass, which has allowed the baby to survive up to, up to term, but now it might cause, uh, it is causing some degree of uh, cardiac issue because the si its size, it's pushed on the mediastinum. It might be safer to resect it while the child is still on uh, the placental circulation and then separate deliver the baby. So that is exit to resection. And exit to ECMO is when we have a very bad uh, CDH, which will not survive if you just if you just deliver like that. These babies also are babies with severe congenital heart diseases. You can try exit to ECMO. So these are the conditions which you can uh, offer exit for. Now let's come down to the uh, to what we are here to hear. That's the anesthetic management of these different categories of uh, of problems. It's very important that you should have a multidisciplinary meeting with the mother and the family because um, the mother and the family must be devastated to hear about the problem the fetus has. And all the specialists that are involved, mainly the, the high-risk obstetrician, the neonatologist who is going to take care of this baby once it's delivered, the pediatric surgeon who might be doing the procedure, the radiologist who's going to read the fetal echo, the MRI, 
the cardiologist who needs to be in attendance to look at the fetal heart as the procedure is going on, the anesthesiologist who is to be who is going to be in charge of this baby, it could be an obstetric anesthetic or a pediatric anesthesiologist, whoever is going to be there should be there, or both of them can be there. And also the all the even the nursing team, everybody needs to have a, a multidisciplinary meet must be there on the previous day. And of course, like in any other case, going under anesthesia, a detailed PAC is a must. You must look into the maternal history, the maternal uh, anesthetic history, or any, any look for any comorbidities, because the mother is an innocent bystander. You don't want any harm, any risk for the mother to be there. If it is so, you may not entertain this fetal surgery. So you look very closely into the, the history of this mother, or do a good, very thorough physical examination, and you ask for whatever investigation you think it's required. The routine blood, blood picture, or whatever additional investigations you want, you want an echo, echo of the mother, x-ray, you go ahead and ask for all the investigations that you would like. And of course, what very, very important is um, you should take uh, informed consent. It's not, the, of course, uh, the, the treating the physician surgeons would have taken their own consent, but uh, we need to take our consent. We have to detail about the postural puncture headache. If you're planning to put an epidural, we need to tell them about the risk of the regular, as you would, uh, risk of aspiration. We need to tell them, uh, the, uh, actually the specialist would have told them, but we have to tell them about the risks, the benefits, and what are the other alternatives that they can follow. Th that those are what is related to anesthesia, we can say, but the mother should be aware of the risks and the benefits and what are the other options that she has and what could be the outcome. It could be a fetal demise can also happen. Premature rupture of membranes and premature labor can happen. So all this has to be explained to the mother in detail. At the end, they may decide not to go ahead. So the mother should have a full knowledge and a full right to refuse the surgery if she is afraid of it, but that is up to her. The next thing is uh, we should not forget about the blood arrangements. We should do a type and screen for minimally invasive procedures. It's enough. A type and screening is enough. But for open mid gestation procedures, you have to do a type and cross match and at least give poor blood available, readily available. And we'll not forget the fetus. For the beet fetus also, a leuco leukocyte reduced, irradiated or negative blood, which cross match the mother should be readily available. Now, a fetus will have some 100 to 160 ml per kg of blood, depending on what stage of gestation it is in. And, uh, and most of this, half of this blood will be in the placenta in case there's placental bleeding or whatever reason. Blood for the fetus also should be ready. Of course, what we should know, what is the fetal baseline heart rate? It can be anywhere between 140 to 80 or even higher, but we should know what is the heart rate, fetal baseline heart rate. We should also know what the cardiac function of the baby. These are questions we need to answer before we give anesthesia. So fetal cardiac function is it good, it's a, is it uh, working well, is the heart contracting well, or uh, is there any, any uh, cardiac failure sitting in? So we need to know that. And of course, most important, the fetal weight for drug dosing, we need to know that fetal weight, which uh, a good radiologist will be able to tell us. Or the, uh, the obstetrician who is doing the ultrasound can estimate the weight and tell us. So what is the anesthesia for these minimally invasive procedures? Minimally invasive procedures, it's uh, mostly, if it is the procedure, as uh, I, we talked about what procedures are done as minimally invasive. We said it's like blood sampling from the umbilicus. We said amniotic band release. And we said the most common could be a twin to twin transfusion syndrome. In twin to twin transfusion, we are going to coagulate with a laser the abnormal connections, or it could be a trap where you're going to do a, a radiofrequency ablation and do a fetal reduction. These are the common uh, scenarios that you see in minimally invasive procedures. Now, when they come for this minimally invasive procedure, we know that the placenta and the umbilical cord, they do not have any pain receptors. So if procedures on that is not going to produce pain. So the only area that the, the mother is going to have pain is the entry site in the abdomen. There you can give local an anesthesia and procedure can commence. Now, depending on the anxiety level of the mother, you can decide to give intravenous sedation or not. Intravenous sedation can be given with midazolam or fentanyl. That's what we do. Dexmedetimidin is also a, a, an option. But remember that you should not over sedate these mothers. Mild to moderate sedation is enough. And talking to these mothers is much more powerful than any other sedative, actually. So uh, do not over sedate because 
the position we may want, uh, the surgeon might request the mother to change the position a bit or to hold still or something. So if you have an over-sedated mother, that won't do. Uh, Neuraxal anesthesia, it's, uh, some surgeons might request for it, but generally all procedures are done under maternal local anesthesia only. You know, some surgeons might insist, but it's generally not done. If you have a very anxious mother, yes, you should sedate. Even you might need more sedation. The problem, sometimes you have a mother with a very big abdomen, polyhydramnia, so much of polyhydramnia that when she's lying down, she has backache, and she may not be able to lie like that for a long time. So as you're starting out initial stages, the surgeon might require more time. So lying like that for a long time might be a problem. So that's one situation where you can consider giving a neural neuraxial anesthesia, but we have never given neuraxial anesthesia so far. We have always got, gone with maternal local anesthesia with sedation. Remember, no uterine relaxation is required, not much uterine relaxation is required for this and only limited fetal sedation. And um, of course the monitors, standard ASA monitors, should be there for the mother. The fetal heart rate monitoring should be done. It's very important. You should be done at the start of the procedure and end of the procedure to reassure that the fetal status is good. And uh, initially the, uh, the teaching was to limit the IV fluids. Now it is, we can do the maintenance IV fluids safely to not overload, but maintenance, but the maintenance is not going to be much for a half an hour procedure. Of course, if the procedure, minimally invasive procedure, I said, if this, uh, if you're using an endoscope, a petoscope, we can do procedures on the baby. Like if you want to do a, a tracheal balloon, if you want to put a tracheal balloon, on, uh, then you have to do this procedure on the baby, not on the placenta or the cord. So the baby should not move. Or if you want to put a shunt, a vesicle or a, or a, uh, or a, a shunt into the thoracic uh, cyst, then you don't want the baby moving. So in those conditions, what you do is you give a, what is called a IEM fetal cocktail. The baby is injected with a fetal cocktail of fentanyl, which 20 mics per kg of a muscle relaxant. It can be any muscle relaxant. We can, be, we can give vecuronium, brocuronium, pancuronium, whatever. The dose is vecuronium, it's 0.2 mg per kg. And of course, it is uh, combined with atropine so that there's no fetal bradycardia. Atropine, 20 mics per kg but try to limit the volume, so 2.2 to 0.5 ml. Remember this fetus at uh, around end of fifth month, they are able to sense pain. That is there, the withdrawal reflex is there. And by the end of six months, some connections are there to the thalamocortical structures and that uh, affective response to pain also starts to develop. Though it's only by around early ninth month that ECD uh, is seen in EEG is seen in 80% of the fetuses, but since we don't know when they really start appreciating pain, it's better to give fetal analgesia for any procedure on the fetus, because otherwise we don't know how it's going to affect their development later. Of course, it goes without saying that maternal hemodynamic has to be maintained within 10 to 20% of the baseline. For this, phenylephrine or uh, ephedrine can be used. Usually in these procedures, the use of phenylephrine and uh, ephedrine or phenylephrine is not so much, but remember they may come with an NTG patch applied early on in the preoperative area to pre or in the previous night itself. Madam, please unmute. Dr. Madam, please unmute. Madam, you is that are, okay? Uh, yeah, now you are audible. Oh, did, did you hear up to what I said till now? You are talking about a patch. Right, yeah, so that's it, yeah. So uh, I think I've skipped a few slides. I'll have to go back. Um, so yeah, so um, so the problem is we had a one, one patient who dropped her BP after a, a, some sedation was given. That may be because this patient was on an NTG patch and had received a catch and channel blocker to prevent premature onset of labor. That's given to most, uh, most mothers. So we have to be careful. So it has only happened once in our institute. So that is about, uh, so that's all that is a concern for minimally invasive procedures. Let's move on to the next one, which is open mid gestation procedures. And the main important ones here is a myelomeningocele repair and the sacrococcygeal teratoma. It'll be uh, this myelomeningocele repair. Uh, the thing is that 
a trial has come up, came out called the MOMS trial, that is management of myelomeningocele study that came out into, it was conducted over a period of around seven to eight years from 2003. And the results showed that if the myelomeningocele defect is closed in utero, the outcome is much better. What happens is that during development, the neural plate folds to form the neural, uh, to form a neural uh, tube. Now this, if this doesn't happen effectively in any area, the spinal cord and its nerve roots are left exposed. And this is a, a defect in primary neuralation and will damage the spinal cord at this spot. That is the first hit. Now, first hit. The second hit is like, it's exposed to the amniotic fluid around and to the physical trauma that the movement of the baby is going to cause. So this is again going to cause more damage to the exposed cords. So what do we do? We have to cover it. And this was uh, experimentally done in sheep models and it was shown that it's going to be more, it's going to show, to improve the morbidity. And through the trial uh, done for the mom study, it was even proven beyond doubt that it is so in human fetuses also. And the trial was stopped before it could, you know, reach completion or do it a the complete numbers. So you can see in these two pictures, if you see, you can see there's a myelomeningocele seal here and it has been repaired. And once the repair happens, you can see in the brain, because the fluid is leaking out through this myelomeningocele seal defect, the hind brain has herniated here. The posterior fossa becomes smaller. The hind brain herniates. This leads on to the development of hydrocephalus during the first year. But in this baby who has undergone the repair, the hind brain herniation has reverted back and there's no more hindbrain herniation. And maybe as a result of that, the occurrence of the need for the occurrence of hydrocephalus and the need for BP shunt has come down in these babies with undergone repair. Not only that, the other plus point is that these babies who has undergone repair can walk without support. Not all of them, but a, a good percentage can walk without support. That's enough reason to promote uh, the myelomeningocele repair in fetuses. So how do you give anesthesia for an open? We haven't done in our institute any open mid gestation procedures, but this is how the anesthesia should go for an open mid gestation procedure. It's a general anesthesia and you place a high lumbar epidural catheter, but you do not start it. You do not dose it until the end of the surgery because you don't want a sympathetic block at the baby fall. Wet gender buttock is important. It is important, the minimally invasive as well. Here also it's very important. If the gravid uterus compresses the aorta, the uterine arterial flow might come down and then that's not good for the baby. The fetus, the lifeline of the fetus is the uteroplacental blood flow. So you cannot have anything compressing the aorta. Nor can you have the uterus compressing the vena cava because if you compress the vena cava, the venous pressures are going to go up and that is again going to limit the flow of blood through the uterus. So uh, this wedge is very important. And like in any other cesarean section, you go in for a rapid sequence induction and an endotracheal tube. And what the difference starts emerging here, you need, it's good to put an arterial line because this, you're going to open a, a, a highly um, vascular organ such as a uterus and you, there's chances that it might bleed. So you need a good arterial line, not only for that reason to, you also need to make sure that the maternal hemodynamics are optimal all, all throughout the procedure. And the second IV axis is because of the, of the fear of bleeding, uncontrolled bleeding. So you should have an arterial line and a very good second IV axis. Try not to cause too much of hypocarbia. Try to maintain ET0 to around 30 to 35 centimeters of millimeters of mercury. You don't want the uterine vessels to go into any, any degree of spasm. So try to maintain and the entitled carbon dioxide around 30 to 35 millimeter of mercury. Oh, what are your goals? You should know before we set out doing to give anesthesia, what are the things that you're aiming for? You are aiming for a normal maternal hemodynamics. You want to preserve the uteroplacental circulation in its pristine stage. To, and you want to maintain the blood flow to the fetus. That is one thing. And of course, you want a very profoundly relaxed uterus during the hysterotomy procedure. You don't want the uterus contracting when you touch it. You don't want an irritable uterus. It can cause abruption. It can reduce when you're contracting uterus is going to contract on the venous blood vessels that's running through it and it's going to raise the venous pressures and reduce the uteroplacental blood flow. You don't want that to happen. So you want a very relaxed uterus when you're operating here. And of course, minimize the fetal uh, cardiac 
you want to minimize any fetal cardiac dysfunction that might happen. Why should a fetal cardiac dysfunction happen? Because inhalational anesthetics, if you give in high dose for a very long time, it is known to cause fetal cardiac dysfunction. So these are the three important things that you want to prevent. So this is actually uh, the uterus which has been exposed. A famine steel incision is being made and now the uterus lies exposed. What is the next step? The next step is to ensure that there is a highly, very flabby uterus. It's, it should be totally relaxed. So what can you do for that? You can give very high doses of inhalational anesthesia, two to three mac. You can use uh, sevaflurane or desflurane. That's uh, what generally is used now. Two to three, but if you use two to three mac of inhalational anesthesia to produce this flaccid uterus, the byproduct of that is going to be a significant hypertension in the mother, which is a strict no-no, it should not happen. So what can you do? You have to use good vasopressors here. Phenylephrine must be used in a bolus doses of 50 to 100 microgram to overcome this. You can use ephedrine also, of course, but phenylephrine is a good choice. And remember, since we might be using other tocolytic agents to ensure this relaxed uterus, please restrict in open gestation procedures, we have to restrict IV fluids to 1 to 1.5 liter, or in the later in post up they might go into pulmonary edema. So we have to restrict fluids, we have to use this high MAC of inhalation anesthetic, a sure recipe for a significant hypertension. So our, our savior is going to be these vasopressors. What are the additional things that you can use to ensure a relaxed uterus. You can use a magnesium sulfate. Generally, in most centers, a magnesium sulfate bolus, four to six gram, followed by an infusion, one to two to two gram per hour, is usually started. And if um, NTG bolus is also, uh, say 20 to 40 mic, even up to 50 to 500 mics can be used to ensure uh, that the, the uterus is relaxed if just the inhalation anesthetic is not enough. All these are things that can cause hypertension. Now remember, now uh, recently, not very recently, but still uh, some centers are advising a technique called SIVA, that is supplemental intravenous anesthesia. Here you supplement with propofol and remifentanil, remifentanil outside. Here we don't have remifentanil, so fentanyl would be our choice. If you use propofol and uh, uh, fentanyl or remifentanil as IV infusions, we can bring down the MAC inhalational NCC concentration to 1 to 1.5 1 MAC with a good relaxation, still maintaining the good rela uterine relaxation. So this would help reduce the fetal cardiac depression that high uh, alveolar concentrations of inhal inhalational anesthetics would produce. Now, you can see that after giving such a high inhalational anesthetic concentration, you can see the uterus has become very, very flabby. And they are using now after, you know, after uh, using some uh, sutures to, uh, to uh, pull up the uterine walls, they are cutting it using a stapler. This is a special stapler, which has got absorbable staples in it. So you should, using this special stapler, they uh, incise the uterus. So the walls as they're cut are, are stapled together. So there's no bleeding edge and the, uh, and the membranes are also stapled closed here so that there's no leak in between the membranes. So this is a very important uh, device in this procedure as this uterus is actually 10% uh, of the cardiac output is going through this uterus every minute. This is a very important step. And before this step actually, uh, the, the obstetrician would scan with the ultrasound and make sure that uh, this procedure is not done anywhere near the placenta. We don't want a, a, a um, catastrophic hemorrhage happening. So uh, the placenta is mapped out and, 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 um, and this is placed in a safe zone. Once, this, once a uterine incision is made, you can see that the amniotic fluid inside is going to rush out. Now, amniotic fluid rushing out will reduce the size of the uterus. You don't want that. You want to maintain the uterine volume. So how will you maintain the uterine volume? A catheter is placed here with, through which warm saline or ring lactate is uh, infused to maintain this uterine volume. Uh, there is an uh, emphasis has to be placed on the term warm because if it's not warm and the baby's temperature goes down, it can cause fetal distress, it can cause fetal bradycardia. So it has to be a warm fluid. And as soon as the baby is visible here, you have to give the, it's better to give the IM fetal cocktail so the baby doesn't move. And after giving the IM fetal cocktail, which has been uh, prepared in a sterile manner and handed to the uh, nursing side, 
um, after that, the fetus is appropriately positioned for the surgery, whichever is whatever the surgery is going to be done, that part is brought under the incision. And, and then, uh, uh, and the surgery commences. Continuous during this procedure, how do we monitor the status of the fetus? It has to be monitored. So a cardiologist is scrubbed in with an echo probe on the uterine wall, looking at the heart. That's all that cardiologist does. He looks at the fetal heart, looks at the rate at which it is beating. Now the fetal heart, the fetal cardiac output is dependent most only on actually only on the heart rate. So you cannot have it come down. It's like, it's not a very compliant muscle here. So uh, it cannot beat hard. It cannot contract harder. It can only contract Past. So uh, there's a cardiologist who's looking at it, looking at the heart rate, looking at uh, the filling of the ventricles, whether it's patient is becoming, whether the fetus is becoming hypovolemic, looking at the atrial, the uh, atrial ventricular valve function, and guiding us about the replacement of the condition of the fetus. He'll alert if the fetus goes into bradycardia. A heart rate less than 100 is bradycardia in a fetus, and if it is, go, it, it indicates that there is fetal distress. If you think there is fetal distress and every, everybody stops and sees and see what is causing this fetal distress. So it could be that the mother's BP has come down and nobody has noticed it because everybody is busy doing something. You have to make sure the BP is stabilized. You have to give vasopressors and make sure it's stabilized. Or it could be that there's, there is metal hypoxia due to whatever reason. Make sure your tube is okay. Dial up your FIO2 and take care if that is the problem. But most common problem is that the umbilical cord is compressed against something. It may be because the uterine volume has come down and the walls are pressing against this umbilical cord, or it may be something physically impinging on the umbilical cord. If it is so, make sure that is sorted out. Or if it is because the uterus is uh, regaining its tone and it's about to contract, that's why it's very important to keep on communicating with the surgeon. The anesthetist and the surgeon has to be constantly communicating regarding the state of the uterus, whether it is relaxed or its tone is coming back. If that's the reason, that could be the reason. You could deepen the plane of anesthesia. Or if you've already tried that, you could give an NTG bolus. All this has to be done. And if that is still not, the heart field heart rate is still not responding, then you will have to, uh, you have to do the final thing that you have to resort to epinephrine and atropine, which has already been loaded steroid in a sterile manner and is, and is, uh, is in the uh, operating field with the nurse. So epinephrine 10 mic per kg and atropine 20 mic per kg must be loaded and kept there on a sterile tray for use if the fetus fetal brady, which is not responding to the usual uh, measures that we take. So after surgery, the volatile agent is discontinued and but the mother is reversed and extubated. You have to be careful because here we, have, we are using magnesium sulfate that it interacts with the muscle relaxants and prolongs its duration. So you have to be, you cannot be haste, act in haste. You have to wait till the full muscle power re, re, returns before you extubate. You would have started the epidural. You don't want the mother to be in pain because pain and sympathetic stimulation can also lead on to premature labor, the set onset of premature labor. Most important, you must continue the perioperative tocolytic agents. Actually, these mothers may be put on, uh, on a progesterone uh, depot or progesterone vaginal suppositories. They may be on intermethacin and they would be on magnesium sulfate. Postoperatively, they would be continued. For one day, these magnesium sulfate and, uh, may be continued and then they'll be on uh, nifidipine calcium channel blockers for, throughout the pre pregnancy. So uh, this is what that this is the these are the things related to our anesthesia. Most important, maintain the hemodynamics of the mother. At no uh, in no way compromise it. Make sure you have the when you start. Make sure you have the wedge under the buttock. Make sure you have vasopressors ready. Do not give too much fluids since magnesium sulfate is on board. Make sure that uh, that uterus is relaxed before they put an incision on the uterus by you know dialing up your uh, inhalational agents. And if the uterus is not relaxed enough, it's usually rela it relaxes very well with uh, in this deepening of inflation and if not, think of giving boluses of NTG. And once you have a very good uterus, relaxed uterus, then make sure it doesn't contract again. So maintain that state. And make sure that the fetus, you don't deliver the baby here, you just expose the relevant part and you make sure that the uh, uterine volume doesn't come out by you know constantly infusing warm saline inside. You um, you paralyze the baby with your fetal cocktail and carry on the surgery while the cardiologist with the echo probe constantly monitors 
it's a heart rate and alerts you if there's a problem. And at the end, if you extubate when the patient is safely out of the muscle relaxants. Going on to the next procedure, which is an exit procedure. Uh, as there's not much difference between uh, how you conduct an exit procedure and an open gestation, other than few very cardinal points. The initial stages are as usual, you would give GA, you would go for a rapid sequence induction with endotracheal intubation, and you would put in a high lumbar epidural, which you will not activate initially, but only at the end of the surgery. And what is the difference? The main differences are that, of course, you are going to use high volatile agents to relax the uterus as you did for your open mid gestation procedures. And that means you have to use vasopressors too. You can use NTG boluses if high volatile agents are not enough. But here you don't use magnesium sulfate. Magnesium sulfate is stronger acting topolytic, which you don't want. You want, at, after the end of the procedure, you want a good contracted uterus. So though there's no postpartum hemorrhage, so you don't use magnesium sulfate here. And therefore, uh, the fluid restriction is not so important in these exit procedures. So that's a, that's a thing that's a, these are, this is one major difference between uh, the exit and the open mid gestation procedure. We have uh, done two exit procedures in the institute, and uh, we actually, uh, good uterine relaxation was achieved at around two max of sevoflurane, and we didn't have to use much of NTG, that is uh, the experience uh, we had. Of course, uh, uh, in exit procedures, once the uterine incision is made, we do deliver, we deliver, partly deliver the baby. So when we partly deliver the baby, if the hands are out, if it's an exit, exit to airway procedure, we would deliver the baby up to the nipple level probably, in which case you, the hands can be outside. And this, on the hand, we can put a pulse oximeter. So this has, to be made, this has to be sterile pulse oximeter already given to the operating field. So they can wrap it around a, a digit or a palm. Uh, but uh, the problem, there are certain drawbacks in using this pulse oximeter for uh, fetal monitoring. The thing is that uh, if the light falls on it, it will not give a correct value, but then that can be can overcome by you know shielding it with something. Uh, the normal saturations in fetus is around, you know, it can vary, it can vary from 40 to 70 percent. So that's the saturation that you're expecting. At these saturations, the readings may not be very correct. So we really do not depend too much on the pulse oximeter saturations here, but uh, we do use it if uh, if it's going to if your surgery is going to be a more extensive one and not just an exit to a, a airway procedure, a simple exit to airway, like a small tracheostomy, uh, like a tracheostomy or a endotracheal intubation. It's a good idea to get an IV access to the baby or the, in the hand, this, uh, the pediatric surgeon uh, can get an IV access and give you the uh, extension. So if you, there's any blood loss, you can supplement the, uh, supplement uh, the PRBCs that is, uh, that is available. She also, of course, the cardiac, uh, so the, echo, the cardiologist has got that echo probe and is constantly monitoring to alert us if there's fetal bradyhemia, which is a sign of fetal distress. So I already said we only partly deliver the baby for the procedure because you don't want the uterus volume to come down. If the, if the uterine volume comes down, there's a chance of placental abruption and placental abruption will be catastrophic. And so the, you don't want that. You want good uterine placental blood flow to go on till the whatever procedure we're doing is complete. Of course, like in the you know, in the open mid gestation, you want the baby to move, so the cocktail will be given. Though with this high uh, doses of inhalational anesthetics and all the all the uh, narcotic that we give, the baby will be partly anesthetized only; it will not be moving so much. But we have to ensure that it doesn't move, and therefore a field cocktail has to be given. Uh, this is part, only partly delivering the baby helps maintain the temperature, baby's temperature, as well as the uh, uterine volume. If it is a, a exit to airway, a direct laryngoscopy and endotracheal intubation can be done. So we have the time, that's the advantage. It doesn't have to be an emergency situation or we don't have to put the child to risk of any neurological damage. The child is safely on the uteroplacental circulation, still getting its oxygen from the mother. So we have the time to secure, to do a, 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 a good scopy and see whether you can intubate. And if you cannot intubate, you may have to go for other options. Um, you may have to, like if you intubate, if you have a flexible bronchoscope, it's good to you know, ensure that you are inside. Suppose you cannot intubate, what do you do? You have to try alternative methods. You may have to, if it's a very big mass, you may have to resist some of the mass before you can do a tracheostomy there. 
or um, or you may have to divide some strap muscles. You may, there may be various things, the various uh, procedures you may have to do to, before you can uh, uh, you can uh, get that airway. But you have the time for that. There's no emergency. You get you have the time. You just have to make make sure the metal hemodynamics are good and the uterus is relaxed. That's it. And you have to make sure that the, your uh, umbilical cord is not compressed by anything. So then that might end with a tracheostomy, but you have a baby who is safe. So this is a baby in whom we, uh, an exit was done. This was taken uh, post, uh, in a few days postoperatively. You can see the tracheostomy in position. And this baby had a congen con congenital high airway obstruction known as chaos. So you can see that uh, it is this obstruction here. There's no way we could have intubated, though it was tried once. So after that, after that first try, we intubate where the tracheostomy was done and the baby is doing well. So uh, now once the tracheostomy, uh, we have secured the airway, you can uh, uh, you know, clamp the umbilical, uh, uh, you can clamp the umbilical vest artery, you, I mean the umbilical cord, and after you can deliver the baby and then you can start ventilating. Now we must cut off all your inhalation anesthetics and your next step is to make sure that the uterus contracts well. So you have to start like in any cesarean section, you give your uterotonic drugs, you start your oxytocin, you massage the uterus. And if that doesn't work, you have to think of giving carboprost IM injections. So you make sure that uterus is well contracted and all your inhalation anesthetics out of the system. And if you need any more anesthesia, it has to be IV anesthetics that you use. Once the patient is well uh, reversed, you extubate awake, you would start the epidural for the postoperative pain relief. There's no role for any tocolytics here again. So the main problems to watch out for here, as I enumerated earlier on, is failure to preserve the uteroplacental perfusion. If the baby drops, that is calamity. Failure to ensure a relaxed uterus prior to his treatment, that's also a very uh, a big no-no. When if a fetal bradycardia develops, it's a harbinger of fetal distress. Everybody stops what they're doing and they look at what can be corrected. And, if, um, and also make sure you have fetal resuscitation drugs that's uh, epinephrine and atropine on hand. If there is maternal hemorrhage, look out. It can happen, look out for maternal hemorrhage and do what is required. I have blood ready in OT. These are the points that I like to uh, say and uh, I would, uh, I think I've gone through most, most of what I wanted to say. And I, I would recommend uh, Dr. Devnath Chatterjee has written uh, Two beautiful, two or three, two beautiful articles actually in Pediatric Anesthesia Journal over the last few years. He's uh, written about fetal anesthesia, how to give it. And then he has uh, written recently about error traps in fetal anesthesia. It's a very good read. And recently, uh, an article has come out, a consensus statement has come out on how to give fetal anesthesia. These are three very good readings for, uh, uh, for anyone who's interested in fetal anesthesia. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am, for that comprehensive uh, talk on uh, anesthesia for fetal surgery. It's a relatively new topic, and uh, uh, it's good to know that uh, you are uh, you have been doing it uh, at the institute. No, we have only done two cases of exit. Uh, I mean, minimally invasive. We have done uh, many, but that's an anesthesia part of it is very. Uh, it's very not challenging as you would say, but exit we have only done, done two and we haven't done any open mid gestation procedures so far. Fine. And before we open up the talk for uh, a discussion uh, comments from the audience, uh, I think uh, we have a question in the chat box. Uh, can I, would you like to take it up now? Yes, can sure. I, uh, yes, the, the question is, uh, dexmedetomid in, in therapeutic doses uh, seem to produce bradycardia and hypotension. Is it safe to use uh, for IV sedation in pregnant women? And could you yeah, recommend uh, the safe dose? Uh, we are uh, using, for our patients, mostly we, are, uh, we communicate with them and uh, we, use, we ask uh, mothers whether they want to be sedated. Are they anxious? First question we ask is, are, are you anxious? Would you like sedation? They mostly say they don't want any sedation, but uh, they will tell us if they want sedation. And they do, patients whom we think are very anxious, we sedate with the midazolam and fentanyl. And um, uh, these patients uh, are reassured if you talk to them. But some patients do need good sedation with uh, midas and fentanyl. 
Now, dexamethasone dexamethasone is what some centers use. Uh, the I talked to you about uh, Devna Chatterjee. He works in Colorado. They there they use dexamethasone infusion, and uh, also in Cincinnati, in Cincinnati also they use dexamethasone infusion for uh, maternal sedation. But we have to make sure it's not uh, it's only mild to moderate sedation, not uh, deeper sedation. Thank you. <clears throat> I think we can open up the. Uh... Uh, talk for a few comments from the senior faculty members. And uh, I think, uh, Binil, can we unmute everybody? They can unmute, they can unmute and make their comments. Dr. Binil, this is Dr. Meena Chandram. Please, uh, sir. Uh, madam, uh, this is exactly like uh, watching a dream sequence in a movie because we have not seen uh, any fetal surgeries. And anyway, initially when you were talking about only surgical aspects, I was wondering why anesthesia aspect was not touched. Anyway, usually surgery follows anesthesia. Now anesthesia followed surgery. Anyway, without that introduction, it would have been very difficult to imagine. And my question I have put in the chat box. See, how often you do fetal surgeries in your institution? That's what sir, I said. Minimally invasive procedures that we have done more than 2,000. Uh, 2000 and more, but uh, that's not anesthetically for us. It's not very challenging because I, as I told you, most of them can be done just with a, a local infiltration and minimal sedation. But uh, what is challenging would be open mid gestation cases, which we have not done any, but exit cases we have done too. And those two cases were for high continental high airway obstruction. So uh, we have done exit, actually, we have done three exit procedures. One was a long time back, and that was for a, a, a malformation or a lymphoid malformation of the neck. That baby just required an endotracheal intubation, an exit to airway. That was all that the baby required. The second and the third babies required a tracheostomy. And what may be the reason for this uh, low frequency of cases? It means lack of awareness in the public as well as the medicos that the cases could be referred. Even uh, the patient, the baby was in utero. What do you think? Sir, uh, sir uh, our surgeon, Dr. Mohan Abraham, was saying that uh, uh, said some cases of uh, myeloma, myeloma, it came from myelomeningocele repair. But when they are told that the babies can have problem with, uh, you know, repeated surgeries may be required, even if they undergo the surgery, the ventricular peritoneal shunt in the first year might be required, revisions may be required. And uh, there's no guarantee that the child will walk without support. And they can have higher, you know, other abnormalities. When they are told all this, they opt not to have not to have that baby. That's generally uh, the approach. But when it comes to exit, uh, they're more receptive of uh, the procedure. Mid gestation procedures, they're not so uh, willing to undergo because there's a risk to the mother also because they need LSES for this pregnancy and for all subsequent pregnancy, they need uh, LSES as a risk, a minimal risk of the scar dehiscence structure. So people don't offer me. That's what my understanding. Uh, open mid gestation is. So then, uh, then let me put a straight question. How often you will recommend uh, this fetal surgery is uh, if it is your kit and kin? Uh, minimally invasive. I think you should undergo minimally invasive because it means you're saving the baby. It, like for a twin to twin transfusion syndrome, you can save both babies if you do a laser for coagulation of the abnormal connections. And in trap sequence, when you do there's so many things that minimally invasive procedure, I think can be done because there's no risk. So there's not that much risk to the mother. There's no scar on the uterus for any dehiscence to be there in future pregnancies. Only risk would be a premature labor. The, the, the fetus might be born premature and the, the problems of prematurity might be there. Now, um, the baby open mid gestation again, are I I don't know maybe I don't know I wouldn't know what I would say unless it happens. I, I appreciate your honesty, madam. Yeah. How, how how many institutions how many institutions are doing successful fetal surgery in India, madam? Uh, I am aware that in Chennai they are doing. Uh, I am not aware of other hospitals where it's being done. Which hospital, madam, in Chennai, which we are not aware. Uh, I think if Dr. Lakshmi is here, she would uh, she would know because she only told me that in Chennai. Uh, they are doing that as it's not in Coimbatore or Chennai. They have done exit. I know. I'm then I think sure. the awareness uh, among the doctors in Tamil Nadu is very less because I am not aware. Uh, Thank you, madam. Yes, Thank you for the nice interaction. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, uh, this is Dr. Jain T. Hmm. Sir, Dr. Meenakshi Sundram. Yeah, tell me, tell me. 
Sir, um, actually, Dr. Suresh at MediScan is doing a lot of procedures, um, like Dr. Rekha was explaining the twin to twin transfusion and other ablation procedures. He's doing them on a daily basis at his center in MediScan. And that Meta Hospital, we did one exit for a child which was referred by him with a congenital thyroid enlargement. So we had to do a, it was a difficult intubation. So we had to do a rigid um, endoscopy and intubate the child as an exit. So this we did at Meta Hospital. Uh, that's nice, madam. Thank you. Thank you for the information. Ma'am, there's another question in the uh, chat box. How often will you have to repeat the fetal cocktail if the surgery is prolonged? Uh, the when you give uh, this IM injection, neuromuscular blockage, they do not cross the placental barrier. The, what is given into the fetus remains in the fetus and doesn't you know, wash out into the mother's blood. Uh, the fentanyl might, but uh, the muscle relaxant doesn't. But I would suggest that at the end of one hour, if it takes more than one hour, you might, it might be worth repeating. I really don't know the answer to that, but I would repeat it after one hour. I know that it'll act for a very long time because it's immature. The, the, the liver and the renal system is very immature and it's going to act for a long time. And the neuromuscular uh, blocking drugs cannot cross the placenta. It's going to remain there. But still, I would uh, think of repeating it after one hour. I really don't know what's the correct answer. The, another question is, what is the ethical aspect of uh, fetal surgery? Ethical aspect of? Fetal surgery. Oh, if you can prove, that is why it's like, a, it's a, the field is very narrow. Like I said, only if you can do it, because there's a risk to the mother. You can only do it if you think you're going to save the baby's life. That's a mortality benefit. Only if you think there's a mortality benefit. Or you think you can reduce the morbidity of that child. Like it was proven in the mom's trial has shown that there's the morbidity is, morbidity is going to come down a lot by doing this myelomeningocele repair. Now, once it's not a total cure, the baby will still have, can still have problems. So you explain every, to, everything to the mother, the risk to the mother, the risk to her future pregnancies and what she can expect. So that's why it's so important for a multidisciplinary meeting before you really get the have the patient on the table they must understand all the risk and what benefit they're going to get and what are the alternative things that they can choose and what is the outcome that can happen even fetal demise all this has to be informed to them and they have to decide whether they want to go through with this it's not a risk-free uh, procedure the risk has to be explained and it's done only for certain procedures where morbidity can be where mortality can be avoided and morbidity can be reduced you do not offer it for in all procedures and also you have to see the the character of the mother it's a young primary you don't offer it for a young primary or if it's a very precious pregnancy you might offer it that's you know it, it depends so that has to be looked into thank, thank you ma'am any other questions? I think uh, you can. It's, uh, you can unmute and ask the question. Um, hello, hello. Yes, sir. You're audible, Hi. sir. You're audible. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Can you're you? audible. Yes. Yes, sir. Chako, sir, please. Okay. Now, just yes, for information. Back um, in 2002 to 2004, a couple of years time, have done a couple of exit procedure in Kim's Kerala Institute of Medical Sciences. Um, some or other after that, there was no request either from uh, high risk pregnancy unit or the new neonatologist. So that was the last time I, I did a couple of cases exit successfully. Just for information. Thank you, sir. Hello. Okay. Yep. There are no more comments or uh, uh, queries. I think it's over to Binil. So thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Actually, today we are lucky to have stalwarts in the field of pediatric anesthesia for our uh, today's program. So I thank uh, Rebecca, madam, uh, for the excellent presentation and for uh, uh, and for moderating the panel discussion. I also thank our panelists. Uh, uh, Elsa, Madam, Lakshmi, Madam, Ekta, Madam, and uh, Ramesh, sir, for uh, explaining our doubt in a, in a very clear manner. So, 
so actually it's a area of very confusion for almost all the anesthesiologists but you you have cleared the doubts in a very clear manner panel so thank you thank you for, for all the panelists for uh, answering the questions and i extend my sincere thanks to dr rekha vargis our professor in, uh, anesthesia Uh, in uh, amrita institute of medical sciences i think madam has taken uh, tra training for fetal anesthesia from uh, uk thank you madam for the excellent presentation and enlightening us today evening uh, in the area of uh, fetal anesthesia i want to correct something i just uh, it's not uk i went to cincinnati with mohan sir dr mohan pediatric surgeon okay and i extend my sincere thanks to uh, uh, today's moderator dr vijish venugopal our uh, president elect national dr venkatagiri and uh, uh, state president dr abdul nasser for organizing today's program so for before yeah, i close, many VIPs, before i close uh, over to giri sir for concluding remarks there there are many vips in uh, today's this thing our next week speaker dr anita shana is there father muller hod dr radesh agde is there and uh, many attorneys of uh, mangalore dr radesh dr anand bangera is there i see many many vips in the this thing dr kuchal babu is there 